Hi everyone, in this video I'll tell you the story of human philosophy encompassing an incredible 2500 years of philosophical history. By the end of this video you will know all the basic philosophical ideas, schools, approaches as well as some of the most influential philosophers from around the world. The video has four major parts and each with two three sections just like chapters in books. In part 1 I'll answer the most fundamental question, why are humans the only species that have invented philosophy? Or where does philosophy really come from? Also how has philosophy evolved in the past 2500 years? And why philosophy has so many branches such as ontology, epistemology, rationalism, empiricism, humanism, utilitarianism, existentialism, postmodernism and more. In part 2 I'll look at the origin and differences between Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy why one emphasizes spirituality and changing yourself while the other emphasizes rationality and changing the world. I'll look at the Greek giants of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle as well as the three giants of Eastern philosophy, the Buddha, Lao Tzu and Confucius. In part 3 I'll look at the philosophy of life and human civilization. Is the purpose of human civilization to promote equality or competition? Is the purpose of human life to seek knowledge or happiness? I'll discuss philosophers such as Sun Tzu, Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Voltaire, Erasmus, Michel de Montaigne, Francis Bacon, Martin Heidegger, Michel Foucault and Bertrand Russell. In part 4 I'll tackle the question of knowledge and human motivation. How do we know reality? I'll discuss the school of European rationalism versus British empiricism and Kant's reconciliation of the two. After Kant, two distinct schools of philosophy emerged to explain human motivation, one sociological and one psychological. Hegel's sociological philosophy argued we are motivated by historical forces, while Schopenhauer's psychological philosophy argued we are motivated by a blind subconscious will. So get yourself a strong cup of coffee and some popcorn and let Fiction Beasts take you on a journey of how Homo sapiens' huge brain terrified their tiny heart. As a result, they invented all sorts of beasts from gods to demons to fairies in an attempt to comfort themselves and explain the world. But also invented philosophy to answer three deep existential questions. Why am I here? Where have I come from? And where am I going? To answer your first question, you're here because you're curious about philosophy, so let's begin. What is philosophy? How did we come about it? And why do we need it? And what has happened to philosophy today? And what's the future of philosophy? Today I'll answer all these questions as I discuss the rise and fall of human philosophy. We humans utilize three massive weapons to navigate the world around us and they are all built in inside us. As a result, we humans are the most sophisticated animal that has ever lived on earth, which is incredible. Next time someone complains about the world being unfair, remind them of these amazing tools that every human has, while other animals don't have all of them. What are they? Like all animals, the first and most important tool is instinct, which most of the time subconsciously shapes our behavior. We have three basic instincts, food, sex, company. Our first and most important instinct is survival. We spend a minimum of eight hours or one third of a day working to earn bread. Imagine we didn't have this instinct, how would you motivate yourself to work? Or worse still, how would you motivate others to work? Our survival instinct goes beyond food. We instinctively avoid danger and anything that threatens our life. Do you think what happened to creatures who didn't have survival instinct? They needed a self-help book to motivate themselves. After working 8 hours in the evenings, we spend hours prowling our city center bars and restaurants in search of a mate or courting a mate. This is the instinct to procreate. Of course nowadays we chase a mate for our recreational purposes. The sexual urge is so strongly wired in us, especially men, that, that we do it despite the fact that most of us have no plan to have children. The giant panda is going extinct because they have become too lethargic to have sex, so the Chinese government spends lots of money to make more pandas. Imagine our ancestors didn't want to procreate, we wouldn't be here. Our third most basic instinct is seeking the company of other humans. While men have a stronger sexual urge, women have a stronger urge for company. 
Without this instinct, we would all end up alone and perhaps would never have a civilization. Basically, our instincts tell us what to do most of the time. So we don't have to really think about it or twist our brain to motivate ourselves to do these things. We instinctively seek food, a partner and the company of other people, which allow our conscious brain to save energy on something else. The second weapon in how we navigate life is our emotions which fluctuates day to day and allows us to understand ourselves and those around us. Our emotions give us hints about our environment. Depending on the time and place, we feel angry, sad, frightened, content, happy and ecstatic. If instincts are like climate that remains stable long term, our emotions are like weather that regulates our daily life. Our instinctive urges push us to do things to achieve what we want. But our environment says yes or no. For example, seeking a partner, we want someone, but that person wants someone else. Here comes our emotions to allow us cope with this failure. Or worse still, our survival is threatened. Our emotions allow us to cope. So emotions allow us to grow, change and adapt to a new place or person somewhat quickly. Our emotions are incredibly powerful in motivating us to do things right away. Negative or positive emotions help us grow and move on and seek a better environment. In fact, one of the reasons humans conquered the world is because we are not happy where we are for a long time. Apart from seeking food and safety, we are also motivated by boredom. So our emotions give our conscious mind more free time to do other things. Instead, our emotions do the job for us at motivating us to move, grow and change. Our third and perhaps the most sophisticated weapon we have is reason, which is the basis of science and technology which allows civilizations to flourish. This makes us different from other animals, our ability to make rational decisions based on informed knowledge and calculated risk. Instinct and emotions are hardwired in us from birth, but rationality is mostly learned through direct experience of our own as well as knowledge passed on from our parents and ancestors, either orally or in writing. In fact, our rationality is so powerful that it can regulate our instinct and emotions. For example, our ability to delay gratification allows us to forego our present pleasures for future and long-term pleasure. Of course, not all humans are born equal when it comes to delayed gratification. Some want their cake right away, some can wait a bit longer. But rationality is an incredible tool for us to look long term, not just here and now. Today we live in a modern world or in the age of rationality. All our modern technological conveniences are the result of rational science. To sum up, humans are hardwired with three incredible tools, instincts, emotions and reason. But where does philosophy fit in this? The word philosophy in Greek means the love of wisdom. So the first true human science was philosophy. In fact, philosophers were the first Russian thinkers who replaced the wise old men or women. They were career thinkers, meaning they were known for their thoughts and wisdoms. So philosophy at its core is a structure of rational thinking. In other words, its foundation is rationality. Why? We humans developed a more sophisticated brain. Perhaps the discovery of fire allowed us to cook our food so we could digest our food much quicker. As a result, we had more time to think. When you're busy, you have no time to think. In fact, I do my thinking while in the toilet because I don't have my smartphone with me. But this brain, good in many ways, also came with a disadvantage. It allows us to develop acute consciousness or self-awareness. The more we understand our environment and our own existence, the more we start to brood and ask difficult questions. One reason today we control our brain by keeping ourselves busy or hooked on something, like work or entertainment or smartphone. But with this thinking brain came the most devastating awareness of all, death. Other animals might know death when it comes to them, so they instinctively avoid danger. But we human beasts know death from an early age. As rational animals, we learn from the past to anticipate the future. In other words, we anticipate death. Despite trying not to think about it, we have this fear in the back of our mind. So this brain of ours became powerful enough to ask important questions. Why are we here? What is reality and how we know it? 
Early humans couldn't explain the world, life, the things around them, especially the sun, the light, seasons, thunder, fire, etc. But the most important question was why death? This is the main theme of the oldest surviving human story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, written three or four thousand years ago in which the hero is seeking immortality. But unfortunately, he fails. So to console himself, he builds a city so people could remember him. Other humans invented gods and religions as security blankets. In fact, the fear of death is so strong in humans that nearly every religion has extended life to afterlife. So death couldn't scare us anymore. You could say that human life is so short that we have to have an afterlife. However, today most people don't believe in afterlife. Politically or practically, early human societies were ruled by its strongest among them, or a group of strong men. Then, through the passage of time, generations later, myths, legends and stories about these strong people were created. As time passed, these legends and myths gave these early strong people titanic godlike roles. As Italo Calvino once said, folk tales are told and retold so many times that they become like pebbles smooth, shiny and perfect. Of course, the earliest gods were usually non-human phenomena such as the sun, thunder, light, dark, earth and so forth. But over time they took a semi-human form. Later, these ideas became more sophisticated in the form of religion that told sophisticated stories about the origin of life and also explained death through afterlife, resurrection or reincarnation. But philosophers tried to explain without relying on gods and the supernatural. So they use reason to ask two important questions, which became the two main pillars of philosophy. One, what's really out there? And two, how we know it. So ontology asks what's reality and what things exist or don't exist. And epistemology asks how we know the world. So philosophy became a rational tool for humans to understand the world, the meaning of life and how to navigate the world correctly. So early philosophers studied all sciences, from stars to frogs and everything in between. But if you boiled it down, the three main subjects for philosophers were the physical world, the origin of life and the human mind. In other words, what is the world and how does it work? What is life and how it works? And what is human mind and how does it work? So remember, these three main topics also play philosophy's own downfall. As time passed, philosophy became too big and too sophisticated, so it gave birth to other disciplines. In 15th and 16th century Europe, the first baby was born. For example, Galileo, Copernicus and Newton were the pioneers of physics, so physicists took over the job of studying the world, the universe, stars, planets and matter as a whole. A big load was off the philosopher's shoulders and now they focus more on metaphysics, i.e. the meaning of life and the property of the human mind. Then in the 18th and 19th century, however, another baby was born. Biology took over the job of studying life. Philosophers no longer needed to dissect frogs or understand the human body. An important biologist was Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution by natural selection revolutionized everything we know about life and its origin. So philosophers were left only to focus on the human mind. But unfortunately, they would snatch that away from philosophers too. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, philosophy gave birth to its last baby. We call it psychology that took over the job of studying the human mind. Two big names are Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung who both placed importance on the subconscious, the unconscious mind, as greater motivation in human behavior. So philosophers didn't have to diagnose the human mind anymore. Phew, for centuries, philosophers were doing the jobs of four people, a physicist, a biologist, a psychologist, and a philosopher. Now they could enjoy a bit more free time and just sit in their comfy chairs and be philosophers. After all, everyone has to retire at some point. But retirement is a tough period in anyone's life. Without things to do, you either face an existential crisis or become lazy and rot away. So today philosophers have become a bit lazy on the whole. But also they are a bit out of touch because physics, biology and psychology have become too specialized. So philosophers don't have the time to rigorously study all three disciplines. Also, they don't want to get their hands dirty dissecting frogs or spending hours staring at a telescope to study the stars or spend time with mentally ill patients. So the big question is, what is the purpose of philosophy today? Should it unify physics, biology and psychology once again? 
or should it find a new path for itself? Friedrich Nietzsche, the first to fully diagnose the problem of Western philosophy, took philosophy back to the cave through his Zarathustra, who instead of prophesizing for a single god and the divine tell us about a new type of human, Ubermensch, who instead of following social values, create new ones through their artistic and philosophical works. Like the early humans who went to the cave to gain wisdom. Nietzsche criticized philosophy for being too rational, not passionate enough. Philosophy is an old man who has produced many amazing kids and now feels lost for a purpose. Why? It's very simple. It lacks passion. Philosophy started as a rational tool, but it was also its downfall. As we saw, science like physics, biology took over the rational side of philosophy and psychology took over the irrational side of philosophy, to put it very crudely. What is left? Not much. Is philosophy completely doomed? Well, not quite. I have an answer. Earlier I mentioned the three big human weapons, instincts, emotions and reason. Biology and psychology are taking care of the instinct and the unconscious. Literature takes care of the human emotions through storytelling. And science takes care of reason. So is philosophy without a chair now? Not quite. My solution is human intuition. There you go. A new philosophy should be based on human intuition. What is intuition? In a nutshell, instincts are mostly unconscious. Reason is mostly conscious. And emotions are somewhere in the middle. Where does intuition fit in? It is somewhere between instinct, the hard rock foundation, and reason, the hard rock roof over your head. So intuition is fluid between two solid surfaces and also right next to emotions, which is very volatile and even more fluid. Intuition is a layer deeper than rationality and a level above instinct. So the new philosophy should be based on intuition because it has direct access to instinct but also reason. So in a way it fits right between the unconscious psychology and the, the conscious rational sciences like physics and biology. Scientists don't utilize intuition so it's a perfect tool for philosophy to understand and explain the world. Why intuition? An intuition-based philosophy can equip us with a better weapon to cope with suffering. Rationality through sciences provide us with security, physical utility and comfort through medicine and technology, like a traditional father would. Science builds your house, produces your food and clothes. Emotions provide you with love and care like a traditional mother would, which is literature and stories. Intuition provides you with the ability to have insights, original ideas, inventiveness and the ability to connect dots so you have a goal or mission in your life or relevance in society. Intuition is fast, snappy and in the moment insight or genius that allows societies move forward. In fact, most inventions and discoveries can be attributed to intuition, not rational thinking. Reason is slow, instinct is too rigid and emotions cloud your judgment in the moment. But intuition is hit and miss. When it hits, it sparks a new light. So, is there a philosopher who bases his philosophy on intuition? I'm glad you asked. Yes, there is. Henri Bergson, a French philosopher, argued that intuition can vitalize life and give us a new spark. As Nietzsche argued, reason-based philosophy has become too stale. For Bergson, intuition is the closest thing to a direct experience of something. For example, if you want to know a city, you can read all the maps and photographs of the buildings. But it cannot be as good as if you walk the streets of that city. For example, you can never fully convey the taste of an apple to someone who has never eaten an apple. That intuitive experience is the closest we human get to experiencing the, the taste of an apple. So intuition takes us back to our nature, while reason is moving us away from nature. Of course, Bergson is famous for his philosophy of time, creativity and humor. He thought intuition and life go together. We know reason tries to tame our natural instincts and emotions. Rightly so, but it can also go too far in taming us into a docile animal with no vitality. Bergson's philosophy is called vitalism because he wanted to liberate us from the chain of reason. So philosophy started as a rational tool to understand the world, life and the human mind. Then it gave away those roles to physicists, biologists and psychologists. 
Now it's almost become redundant, so we need a new intuitive philosophy. But to really understand philosophy and where it stands today, we need to know the history of philosophy, its various schools, approaches, Eastern, Western, humanists, animalists, rationalists, empiricists, social philosophy versus individual philosophy. So in the following episodes, I'll go through human philosophy to give you an overview of the entire 2500 years of human philosophy. Next, I'll explain some of the common philosophical terms like what is the difference between ontology and epistemology, physics and metaphysics, rationalism versus empiricism, humanism versus utilitarianism, existentialism versus postmodernism and more. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. Previously, I discussed that philosophy at its core deals with two fundamental questions what is and how we know it. Those two questions in turn lead to other questions like how we should live our lives. So in this segment, I'll look at some important philosophical terms, questions and various branches of philosophy. For example, what are the differences between ontology and epistemology, or between reason and logic, or between humanism and utilitarianism, or between existentialism and postmodernism? What is metaphysics? What is the difference between rationalism and empiricism? And what is phenomenology? And most importantly, why we grapple with the biggest question today between egalitarianism and elitism. Ontology versus epistemology. Early philosophy was based on two main questions. What is reality, which became ontology, and how we know it, which is epistemology. So ontology asks what is and what is not. And epistemology asks how we know the thing that exists or does not exist. For example, according to ontological philosophy, humans are either animals or not animals. If not animals, therefore humans are sacred and fundamentally valuable. It is accepted as a foundation based on your beliefs, so murdering a human being is one of the most serious crimes. So, thou shalt not kill is based on ontological notion that human life is sacred. So ontological philosophy gave birth to sciences in order to understand the world, nature and human biology. Aristotle is usually considered the father of modern sciences. Epistemology on the other hand is about how we gather knowledge. A good example is how we know what we know. Immanuel Kant said we can never know reality as it is, but we only know things on a limited level. Why? Because everything has to funnel through the human mind, which is structured in a way that categorizes things in a certain way. In other words, we humans put a structure onto the world based on how the human mind works. And the world in itself is unknowable to us because we cannot get out of our human mind. We can never know the thing in itself. Michel Foucault went a step further, saying that knowledge is power, meaning those in position of science and technology have immense power over others. He said there's no impartial or power-free science. Knowledge is a tool in the hands of the powerful. I'll discuss this more later. So to sum up, ontology is the philosophy of existence, while epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge of that existence. Metaphysics versus physics. Physics was part of philosophical studies until a few centuries ago, before it became a separate discipline. Physics mainly studies matter, from the smallest particles to the biggest stars. Metaphysics, however, is the study of what is beyond the physical world, like ideas, forms, and soul, which is closer to the religious idea of God and the spirits. A scientist might say human consciousness is rooted in matter and would not exist without brain cells. A metaphysician, on the other hand, might say consciousness is independent of matter, either comes from a higher power or the universe itself is conscious. So physics is the study of physical matter while metaphysics is the study of non-physical entities. Reason versus logic. Logic has its origins in mathematics. For example, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is logical because it follows a very rigid rule that gives you one answer. But logic is also used as a language of philosophy in order to communicate philosophical ideas. So logic is like a foundation on which philosophical debates take place. Without logic, it is very hard to talk to other people because in order for a discussion to take place, there has to be some ground basic rules on which all philosophers agree. 
So logic is a method of communication for philosophical arguments. A good example is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who wanted to make communication as precise as possible. Also, Bertrand Russell applied mathematics to philosophy. Reason and logic often go hand in hand. Since logic is very rigid, like a computer or a game of chess, some argue it limits human ability to express things that go beyond logic, like human emotions and passion. So reason or rationality is somewhat more subjective and less scientifically rigorous like logic. So reason is often used to persuade people while logic is outcome is independent. In other words, if someone uses logic, the outcome might not benefit the argument while reason is a bit more selective. So people use reason to support their argument. We often use rationalization as a negative form of reason used to persuade people. Logic is more mathematical while reason is more linguistic. Rationalism versus Empiricism Rationalism is a school of philosophy that believes we understand the world based on our prior ability to reason. It places human beings as a special creature with the ability to know the world, so it has its roots in religion that places human beings as an exception to the animal kingdom. In other words, we are pre-assembled with reason as a tool. A good example of a rationalist is René Descartes, who famously said, I think, therefore I am. In other words, the ability to rationally think was enough to know our existence. Leibniz was another famous rationalist. Empiricism, on the other hand, believes that we know the world through experience. Our thoughts come as a result of experience. We know the property of fire because we experience the heat. Babies have no fear of fire inside them from birth. We experience the pain, therefore we associate fire with Empiricism is more British, while rationalism is more continental European, mainly French and German. Famous empiricists were John Locke and David Hume. Empiricism is also close to pragmatism, most associated with northern European cold climates, which make you become more practical. Immanuel Kant combined rationalism and empiricism in his philosophy, saying that experience is not enough to know the world. Our own mental structure imposes categories to the world. In other words, we are not passive just receiving knowledge through experiences, but we actively give the world a structure. He said we cannot know the world as it is, but we know it as our mind is structure. But our knowledge of the world is limited to the limit of the human mental structure. Kant's philosophy also gave rise to a phenomenology that studies an object relative to our own experience not the object in of itself. Kant made a distinction between phenomena, which is how we experience the world, and noumena, which is the world in itself, which we can never know. I'll discuss this later. So, for rationalists, we know the world because we know, while for empiricists, we know the world because we experience things. Political philosophy versus ethics. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that deals with morality, justice, and the legal system. Ethics is more practical and pragmatic, while political philosophy deals with how societies decide what is right and what is wrong, and how to live peacefully in a society and how we punish those who break rules. As a society evolves, so does its morality, so ethics change. Something that might be morally acceptable a few centuries ago is not acceptable today. It also depends on culture. Some actions are morally right in one culture, but not in another. Political philosophy is the study of ethics and how it changes. Egalitarianism versus elitism. One of the most fundamental questions philosophy has grappled over centuries is the idea of equality versus quality. Egalitarian philosophy has its roots in religions such as Christianity that all humans have equal dignity and are equally sacred. But egalitarianism as a philosophy became prominent in Europe during the Enlightenment period of 18th and 19th centuries. Karl Marx is perhaps the most famous egalitarian philosopher who believed in a communist society where all the resources were shared equally among people. Elitism on the other hand believes that we should run society based in meritocracy, meaning not not everyone gets a trophy. Some people deserve certain rights and privileges because they earn those things. Elitism has its roots in nature because the animal kingdom runs on a hierarchy, which is part of the evolutionary process. 
The most famous elitist philosopher was Friedrich Nietzsche, who incidentally lived around the same time as Marx. For Nietzsche, great artists and philosophers are not the same as ordinary people, therefore should not be treated so. Today the biggest debate in the West is these two schools of thought, equality for all or privileges for those who earn them. So egalitarian philosophy believes in equality for all, while elitist philosophy believes in merits. Humanism versus Utilitarianism Humanism was born in Europe during the Enlightenment of 18th century, which replaced God with humans. Instead of the divine being in charge of this planet, we rational humans assumed the ownership of this planet. Humanists believe in an egalitarian world where all humans are equal, which is rooted in religions and belief that humans are created equal. But in reality that is not true. Not all humans are equal. Some are more equal than others, as George Orwell famously said in Animal Farm. So in philosophy the big question is this. Which humans should determine our social, political and moral values? Here comes utilitarianism, a branch of humanism that believes in moral values that benefit the greatest number of people. Not all humans, but the largest majority of humans. The word utility focuses on how something benefits someone. Pre-enlightenment world was dominated by kings and aristocrats while the majority worked to benefit the minority. With its roots in Machiavelli's philosophy of end justifies the means, utilitarianism turned it on its head. Instead of the minority, it focused on the majority. All actions should be judged by the results that bring the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Utilitarianism was big in England and the most famous one was Jeremy Bentham and later Stuart Mill. Today's democracy is a little like utilitarian majority rule, at least on paper. Humanism also gave birth to other isms such as socialism that divides the world based on class, feminism that divides the world based on gender, and nationalism that divides the world based on nationality or ethnicity or language. So humanism puts human in charge of the planet and utilitarian says the majority of humans. Postmodernism versus existentialism Existentialism, popularized after the philosophy of Nietzsche, argues that everything starts with our existence, not God or some divine essence. There is no divine spark, but we just develop a sense of self during our life. Nothing is given to us prior to our birth. A famous existentialist philosopher was Jean Paul Sartre who said that since we have no essence, we are responsible to make something of ourselves. He famously said that we are condemned to be free. While existentialism is concerned with the individual, postmodernism popularized in France is more concerned with communities or cultural groups. Just like existentialism, it is also rooted in the philosophy of Nietzsche, specifically in his criticisms of a single truth within the Western philosophical tradition. While existentialism focuses on the condition of the modern existence, postmodernism focuses on the idea of truth and social values. Western philosophy believed in a single truth, like the idea of a single god. So postmodernism questioned European modernity as a project to unify the whole world around European values of individualism, freedom, and materialism. According to postmodernists, all cultures are as valid as European culture. Therefore, the world doesn't have to become like Europe to be considered civilized. Postmodernism is a reaction to modernity, which includes the Enlightenment humanism on the one hand, but colonialism on the other. Postmodernists put emphasis on power relations, how the weak are forcefully pushed to one side. A famous postmodernist, Michel Foucault, analyzed how the modern state developed effective tools to control people through the prison system, surveillance, mass education, and more. He argued that even sexuality is a power dynamics, men oppressing women, which had a huge influence on the third wave feminism that some argue has become anti-men, anti-masculinity. Foucault even said all knowledge is tied to power, so there is no independent science, therefore science and technology are tools for the powerful to control the weak. So to sum up, the core philosophy includes ontology of existence and epistemology of knowledge and everything else is a branch of these two. Physics and metaphysics are part of ontology. Physics deals with matter while metaphysics deal with non-material phenomena such as ideas, consciousness. Reason and logic, rationalism and empiricism are part of epistemology. 
Reason is a tool to persuade others, therefore more subjective, while logic is mathematical and impartial. Rationalism says knowledge comes from within, while empiricism says knowledge only comes from experience or outside. So outside ontology and epistemology is the philosophy of how to live. Political philosophy studies morality of good and bad, equality or meritocracy, majority mass or minority elite. This is also tied to the meaning of life. Existentialism puts emphasis on the individual, while postmodernism put emphasis on the group identity. Next, I'll look at the differences between Eastern and Western philosophies, why one focuses on physical science while the other on mental well-being. Which should we prioritize, building rockets to conquer space or do yoga for a more peaceful mind on Earth? In the 1930s, there was an interesting conversation between the greatest Indian poet and philosopher Tagore and the greatest German scientist Einstein. The conversation centered on the idea of reality, truth, and beauty. Einstein believed in an objective reality outside the human, while Tagore insisted on the subjective interpretation of reality. To boil it down, Einstein believed in the old theory of physics, solid matter existing with or without humans, while Tagore was alluding to the mysterious theory of quantum physics, that our perception or observation of matter is never really objective. The conversation illustrated the differences in Eastern and Western ways of thinking about reality, one more pragmatic while the other more spiritual. Now let's look at the typical hero in the East and West. A Western hero wants to change the world to make it better for himself and those around him, while an Eastern hero wants to change himself. Western superheroes fight evil to restore justice, peace, correct the incorrect, while Asian heroes either accept their fate or retreat to a forest for some contemplation. Jesus, perhaps the greatest Western hero, confronted injustice and paid for it with his own life. A sacrifice you can see manifest in Harry Potter as well. The Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, however, went to the forest to change himself. Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, retreated to the mountains. In other words, Western philosophy is about change, while Eastern philosophy is more about accepting your fate. A great example of this in literature can be seen in the novels of the Japanese-British Nobel Prize winning author Kazuo Ishiguro. His characters obey their fate and rarely question their somewhat unfair circumstances. However, a typical hero in the West would rebel against their circumstance to change the world. Accepting one's fate or putting up with an unfavorable environment is seen as a sign of weakness in the West, while those same traits are seen as a sign of strength in the East. By the East, my focus is mainly old India, China and Japan. So a Western hero wants to change the world, while an Eastern hero wants to change himself to adapt. In today's world, East and West have come together a lot because Western mode of production, i.e. capitalism, has taken over the world. But if you look closer and a bit deeper, you see a clear philosophical distinction. And if you go back in time, the distinction appears more clear. Why has Eastern philosophy's main focus been on mental well-being, happiness and spirituality and community while Western philosophy's main focus has been physical well-being, rational science, technology, materialism, and individualism. Of course, this is a broad generalization, as there are so many philosophers on either side who are exceptions to the rule. But generally speaking, the main distinction is spiritualism versus materialism, community versus individualism. So in this video, I'll look at some of the answers, but also give more detail about the differences between Eastern and Western philosophy. Does the climate, terrain, and the soil have anything to do with it? Are merchants more concerned with materialism and farmers more with spirituality? Western philosophy as we know has its roots in ancient Greece and later in Rome. The Greeks and Romans were influenced by other civilizations such as the Egyptians and the Babylonians. But there are very little or no written records of an organized philosophy prior to the Greeks. Eastern philosophy has its roots in Indian civilization and the Chinese civilization. If you look at their geographies, Greece is made up of some islands between the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, so large bodies of water sandwiching the land areas. So if you want to move around, all you need is a boat and you could hop from island to island. This allows a much smoother way to move things around. There's less friction on water than land. The ancient Greeks heavily relied on imported food due to its soil not being very fertile. As a result, the Greeks relied on trades which brought goods from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Central Europe and more. But with this commodity trade also came ideas and knowledge. 
so the region was a hub of cultural, scientific and technological exchange. This promoted a more rational discourse which allowed the Greeks to develop a more sophisticated science. For example, Euclid's Elements is the oldest science book, which I'm sure was influenced by the Egyptians, the Babylonians and the Phoenicians. Pythagoras developed his mathematics. Aristotle studied all kinds of things, including animals. In fact, the first Greek philosopher, Thales, was an olive merchant himself, who based his philosophy on water being the most important thing in the world. He famously predicted that good weather, i.e. lots of rain, produced lots of olives, so he got very rich. So the Greeks relied on trade, which allowed the exchanges of ideas and practical sciences. Indian and Chinese civilizations, however, are more centered around rivers and mountains. In other words, quite different from ancient Greece. India and China were blessed by its many rivers that brought amazing soil from the Himalayas, so their agricultural economy could sustain a huge population in big cities, making China and India mostly self-sufficient. Trade with other peoples was a plus but not essential. China's Yellow and Yangtze rivers and ancient India's Indus and the Ganges rivers are all stored in the snowy mountains of Himalayas and traverse thousands of kilometers which bring the fertile soil. It's no surprise that both India and China relied on a crop that is incredibly water thirsty, rice. It's also no surprise that Sadhguru, the greatest Indian guru in the world today, has a simple message, save the soil because soil and farming run really deep in Eastern philosophy. So Greece's geographical terrain allowed trade to flourish between various peoples and cultures, while ancient China and India relied on their rivers to bring good soil to them. The Greeks had to seek food from somewhere else, while the Chinese and Indians waited for their rivers to bring food to them. As a result, from a survival point of view, for the Greeks, merchants were the most important class of people, while in the East, farmers were the most important class of people. Since merchants are mobile, while farmers are stationary, because you cannot carry around your land, these allowed the Greeks to be more open-minded to new ideas, new technology, new sciences. Merchants are also less attached to their ways, therefore easily follow the market or commodity. Today you sell rice, tomorrow potato. Farmers, however, have a harder time to change and adapt quickly. So Western philosophy geared more towards pragmatic sciences while Eastern philosophy geared more towards spiritualism. If merchants don't like something, they change. But if farmers don't get enough water, they wait for the following season or accept their fate. It's harder to leave your land and migrate. So Western philosophy is more change oriented while Eastern philosophy is more fatalistic. In other words, you change yourself. Climate also plays a role. India and China tend to be warmer throughout there, so it makes sense to be in here and now, which Buddhism teaches. Also, seasons play a predictable pattern every year, and people live a more cyclical life. Monsoon comes every year. Rivers flood at a specific time of the year. In a way, it was very similar to the Egyptian way of life around the River Nile. Of course, when you rely on a river, you also experience great famines, but they come every few years or decades. The Greeks navigated the seas where you're for the most part in control of where you're going. Meanwhile, Eastern civilizations were centered around rivers. On rivers, your course is fixed. The river takes you where the river takes you. As a result, Eastern philosophy is more fatalistic. The fate of humans, animals, and plants are in the hands of the same rivers. It meant that they saw all living beings as part of one big family. So they didn't put humans as being outsiders or special or above everybody else. In Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, we are not only from nature, we are nature, just like other living beings. The Greeks, however, experienced colder winters, so they had to source and accumulate food for colder days. Since they relied on trade, wars always disrupted trade routes, which meant you had to source your food from somewhere else. Merchants relied on peacetime to continue trade, but they also benefited from wars as certain commodities were more sought after. It is the old adage, war fuels the economy as money is moved around faster than peacetime. Since things are pretty unpredictable, the Greeks had to think long term and prepare not just for the cold winter, but for the future in case of warfare. Future became the most important time, not here now, but next month, next year. You couldn't afford to be here now like a Zen Buddhist. So this long term or linear perception of time became the dominant way of looking at the world among the Greeks. A famous example is Aristotle's teleological philosophy that everything has a purpose, usually a single destination in the future. 
Western philosophy also through an exchange with the Middle Eastern religions like Judaism, Christianity and later Islam came to understand that humans were separate from the animal kingdom. We are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, punished for our mistakes. As a result, you try to compensate for your past mistakes. You want to correct the incorrect. What do you do? You fight for causes. If you look at literature, heroes are often people who have sinned or made terrible mistakes. To redeem themselves, they fight injustice. One way to fight for injustice is to make other people's life better, often materially. You study the world, you invent new technology to make life easier for others. Eastern philosophers were not looking for material comfort, but more for mental and spiritual comfort. Buddha and Lao Tzu left the city in their spiritual quest and went to the mountains and forests. Solitude allows you to seek answers inside you, not on the outside. Even today, most Buddhist temples in India, Japan and China are located in the mountains and forests, away from the crowd so people can get away from other people. The core doctrine of Buddhism is that material comfort doesn't make you happy in the long run. The Greeks, however, gathered in the city to debate and dialogue like Socrates who would walk around on the streets of Athens asking people questions, while others established schools like Plato's Academy or Aristotle's Lyceum. Western philosophy relied on dialogue and exchange, like merchants do, to flourish, learn and improve. The West built universities, churches and schools in the middle of town and villages so everyone could come, not some remote temples that nobody could go to. In Eastern philosophy, you don't force your will on nature to control or change it, but you try to flow with nature. Since both India and Chinese civilization were centered around rivers, often river flow is seen as nature's way in which you don't resist or remove obstacles in your way, but move around those obstacles. In other words, you change yourself, not the outside world. A good example is Indian traffic moves around an obstacle, be it a cow or an accident. While in the West, the small accident on the road brings everything to a halt. So Eastern philosophy tells you to be more fluid, flexible like yoga and less rigid. But Western philosophy relies on manipulating nature through science and technology to make life easier for humans. As a result, we live in a very comfortable period in history. Millions of people couldn't survive to adulthood, but today, child mortality is its lowest in history. People live longer, healthier. But this also has negative consequences for other species on Earth, as the more comfortable we are, the harder it becomes for some other species in some areas. Asians are on average physically smaller than Europeans, perhaps due to genetic mutation or sexual selection or possibly due to eating less protein, as farmers rely on rice which is a staple diet in most of Asia. How to cope with poor diet? Martial arts in China and yoga in India are used to strengthen and discipline the body. Eastern philosophy is centered on the body as a vehicle to get to a higher place. And this also means Eastern philosophy is more about avoiding conflict rather than confronting others. Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism promote non-violence. Vegetarianism, although trendy in the West today, has been practiced in the East for thousands of years. Jainism is an Indian religion that promotes strict vegetarian diet, and Gandhi, a pacifist himself, admired Jainism for that. Unlike Asians, the Greeks ate a lot of bread, which is four times more protein-rich than rice. Since the Greek states were constantly fighting against one another, as well as the Persians, they developed the Olympic Games which was to train soldiers for wars. It is no surprise that it was the Greeks who made it all the way to India through Alexander the Great. While we have no records of invading armies from India or China going to Persia or the Middle East, it was the nomadic Mongols who made it to Europe, not the more sophisticated civilizations like the Chinese and Indians. In fact, the Chinese built walls to shield themselves from the Mongols. And India was ravaged by a series of invasions by the Greeks, the Persians, the Muslims, the Mongols, and even the British. Why? Eastern philosophy is less centered on conquering the world, but conquering yourself. For example, Buddhism is centered on the inner conflict of fighting or resisting your own desires. If you focus on your inner conflict, you are less likely to engage in an external physical conflict such as tribal or ideological. In Hindu yogi teaching, your soul is the real you, while your physical body is acquired through food you put in your mouth. Not just that, you also acquire your ego or the sense of self through impressions and experiences with others. So your soul is permanent and your body and ego are temporary, fleeting and acquired. Now Einstein versus Tagore conversation on the nature of reality makes sense. Einstein sees an external world while Tagore sees everything internal. In other words, yogi philosophy is based on the pursuit of becoming one with the universe. 
quantum physics has a similar theory that as soon as you observe something, you change it. In other words, we are not separate from the world or universe, we are with the universe. The world is not outside us, but we are the universe. It's inside us. So yoga is one way to tap into or get closer to your universal soul by taming your body and ego and desires. The idea is to let your soul control you, not your body control your soul. Eastern philosophy is based on negation of self, while Western philosophy is firmly rooted in the idea of individual self. As a result of this, the East tends to be more communitarian, where the individual is less important than the community or the universe, while the West tends to be more individualistic. Buddhism's core philosophy is to remove the self to ease suffering. Wanting or desiring is seen as negative because you are feeding the ego. The Greeks are more of a merchant's mentality to grow more profit and become wealthier and wealthier. Merchants are more focused on material success and less concerned with the spiritual side of life. As a result, it was the Greeks who developed a more rational and scientific method to understand the material world. This scientific method allowed objectivity, which meant that Greek scholars could disagree with their mentors. Even thinkers like Plato openly disagreed with his teacher Socrates, and Aristotle questioned Plato. In the East, however, openly questioning your teacher was, and still is, a form of disrespect. Instead of finding flaws in those older than you, you are supposed to respect. This is especially important in Confucianism. Sensei is someone you do not challenge. Western philosophy makes a distinction between good and evil as almost separate entities and separate individuals, or even groups. Often in warfare, the enemy is seen as evil to motivate your soldiers to die in defense of good. This is true on both sides. So once you assign goodness with one way of seeing the world, the opposite of that is naturally bad or even evil. This battle of good against evil allows progress. Those victorious can claim goodness. In these, however, both good and bad are seen as more psychological and less ideological. So good and bad are one or two sides of the same coin. The yin and yang in Taoism means every person has dark and light, good and evil built in them. Good and evil coexist, so no matter how much a side it progresses, it doesn't change the core yin-yang existence. We as humans are neither good nor bad, but a bit of both. Our job is to understand this, so we keep a good balance between the two forces. I think the most fundamental difference between Eastern and Western philosophy is the idea of linear progress in the West versus a cyclical notion in the East, especially in Indian philosophy. The Greeks believed in progress. Socrates developed his questioning method of getting to the objective truth. Plato introduced the idea of perfection. And Aristotle came up with telos for purpose. So getting to Socratic truth, Platonic perfection, and Aristotelian telos or purpose give birth to a Western progressive philosophy and science. So instead of focusing too much on the spiritual side of life, the West focused on making the physical life easier by deploying a scientific method to understand the world and invent technologies that made life easier. As a result, most people today live a comfortable life thanks to Western civilization. People live longer thanks to Western medicine and technology. When survival is no longer an issue, people seek meaning and purpose. So Eastern philosophy plays a major role in bringing inner peace for millions of people in the East as well as in the West who seek meaning beyond material comfort. So to sum up, climate, terrain, and food impacted how the East and West prioritized philosophical understanding of the world. The Greeks relied on merchants and trades, so the priority went to practical sciences and rationality. While in the East, farming allowed big cities to flourish and people live longer. As a result, philosophers were seeking happiness, not physical comfort. Life expectancy also grew in the East, which allowed more reflection in old age. When young, people seek success, but in old age, people search for meaning. Next, I'll discuss the Greek trio of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle by looking at their similarities and differences. In 399 BC, the Greek democracy condemned one of the greatest philosophers to death for his spreading bad ideas among the youth. Today, he is considered the father of Western philosophy and possibly the father of Western civilization. His tragic death sparked a new human philosophy that was based on rational thinking, not religious dogma. Who was this man? It was of course Mr. Socrates. Well, he lost his life, but rationality triumphed. He paid the price with his own life. It's no surprise or exaggeration to tell you that Western philosophy originated in Greece, mainly in the city of Athens. 
Previously, I talked about the differences between Eastern and Western philosophies due to different terrains, food production, cultural exchanges, and so on, that gave rise to a spiritualism in the East while rationalism in the West. Eastern philosophy centered on farming and rivers became fatalistic, while the Greeks centered on trade and the seas became rationalistic. So here I'll talk about the three of the most famous forefathers of Western rational philosophy. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Before I talk about the big three, let me mention a few who came before. The first known Greek philosopher was Thales of Miletus, who said that everything is made of water. Today we know that 60% of human body and 70% of our brain are made of water, so he was right. He also used reason to predict how the weather affected olive harvest and made a lot of money as a result. People at the time believed a good or bad harvest was in the hands of gods. So Thales understood that it had nothing to do with it, but just good weather. So Western philosophy from the very earliest time emphasized rationality to understand and manipulate nature to benefit humans. And he was a businessman. Another notable philosopher was Pythagoras, famous for his theorem A squared B squared equals C squared. He argued that the world is run by mathematical rules, which can be understood through numbers. Even musical harmony is ruled by geometrical rules. So Pythagoras based his ideas on mathematical logic, which is a step deeper and more rigid than rationality. Another logical philosopher is Parmenides, who also used logical thinking and reasoning to prove that human experience gives us false perception of the world, often contradicts with logical thinking. So early Greek philosophers paved the way for rationality to become the method of thinking. Socrates. If you have to name one person as the founder of Western philosophy, one name stands tall above everybody else. It is of course Mr. Socrates, not the football legend from Brazil, but an ancient Greek dude who lived between 469 and 399 BCE. He was the true father of Western philosophy because he developed a robust philosophical method to understand the meaning of life and to expose dogmas. Unlike everyone else, he did not accept things at face value. His questioning or dialectical method of examining everything through a series of questions to get to the bottom of things or finding the truth became the basis of modern scientific method. To understand something, you have to go through a series of questions like what, where, when, why, and how. Once you go through all these questions, the answer you get tends to be the best answer out there. Today, science does the same thing. Scientific theories are tested through a series of experiments. Socrates also questioned the purpose of life itself. For him, the purpose of life was to be virtuous. How can you be virtuous? Again, you have to examine your life critically. You cannot sit in your comfortable chair and live in ignorance. Uncomfortable truths are better than comforting lies. He famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, ignorance wasn't bliss, just stupid and unworthy. This had a massive psychological shift in how people saw the world and themselves. You couldn't just rely on gods or even the priests. You had the ability to rationally question things and get to the truth for yourself. The Athenian democracy saw him as a threat, awakening the youth, so they forced him to sip hemlock poison which killed him in 399 BC, making him a true martyr of philosophy. Socrates was a street philosopher who walked around the streets of Athens to question people and have a dialogue about life and philosophy. He was like a modern day provocateur or a whistleblower, the authorities didn't like it. Socrates' philosophical legacy was to make truth the most important aim of philosophy. Philosophy wasn't to tell you comforting lies, but it was to challenge you into discomfort. In Western philosophy, Socrates narrowed its scope into one single truth, which is the basis of modern science today, searching for the ultimate theory that explains everything. Quote, there's only one good, knowledge, one evil, ignorance. This single truth became the cornerstone of Western philosophy for almost 2,500 years until the German Nietzsche questioned it, paving the way for postmodernism that believed in multiple truths. Socrates didn't leave any written records because he was busy on the streets challenging strangers about their truths. I wonder if he was around today, how we would challenge people about my truth, your truth. First, people would think he's crazy. Second, he would go mad with everyone having their own truths. Plato 
After the death of Socrates, the torch was passed on to one of his students who also wrote his teacher's philosophical ideas down. Plato, who lived between 427 and 347 BCE, having witnessed his teacher executed by the democratic mobs, was an idealist, arguing that we all have a perfect idea of something, but in reality this does not exist. It only exists in our mind as a perfect form of that thing. There are chairs we see inside a room, but those are just models of a perfect chair that only exists in our mind. In other words, the chairs that humans make are modeled on a perfect chair inside the human mind. We see a mere shadow of what reality is on the outside. His famous thought experiment, Allegory of the Cave, illustrates that if you face away from the light source and see your own shadow inside a cave, that's how we perceive reality. Not what it is, but its shadow through our senses. So for Plato, humans can pre-assemble with all knowledge. In other words, we don't learn through our experiences or senses, but it's all inside. It only comes out when we experience it. Quote, what we call learning is only a process of recollection. This makes Plato's philosophy somewhat counterintuitive. We think what's on the outside is the real thing, and what we have on the inside, in our mind, is a mere representation of that real object. Plato thinks the opposite. What we see on the outside is the shadow of what's in our mind. We have an innate knowledge of the world from birth, and what we learn is just re-remembering or recalling those things that are already stored inside us. This is very similar to how the rationalists saw knowledge, which I'll discuss later on. Plato's idea of knowledge coming from inside us can also be interpreted in terms of the subconscious or Jungian collective subconscious deeply embedded in us from our evolutionary past. For instance, the fear of a snake in us is not because we experience snake bites in our own life, but because our ancestors experienced it in savannah, in the trees, or jungle, or in the cave. Despite us living in beautiful safe houses, we still have the inner experience of being in the dark cave. Another example is horror movies. Our desire to see horror movies is simply because we still want to experience the fear from time to time because that fear is inside us, and horror movies simply stimulate that fear. Sigmund Freud's dream interpretation is another way to understand Plato. In other words, dreams are our little window into the subconscious world inside us. Fiction writers, artists, musicians often experience a trance-like state when they are immersed in their art, tapping into their subconscious to bring out an art that is appreciated by many people simply because they reach a deeper well inside to drink from the collective subconscious knowledge. Despite being the artistic uncle, Plato also had a strong opinions about politics. Plato was a republican and saw democracy akin to a mob rule as it killed his teacher Socrates. So he argued that philosophers were better suited to rule society as a republic. Just like Nietzsche, he had a low opinion of general public as unsuitable to rule a society while philosophers were better equipped to rule a society. So he set up his academy where he wanted to cultivate the best minds of a generation, the elites of society. Today's university is very much modeled on Plato's academy where the intellectuals lock horns to discuss ideas. And one of those people was Aristotle who graduated from his academy. Plato is called the idealist philosopher, however his student Aristotle went a different route towards practical knowledge. So to sum up, Plato's teacher, Mr. Socrates, questioned things to find the truth. Plato said, truth or perfection only exists in the soul, in the mind, or in the world of ideas or forms, and only their shadows are perceived through our senses. So Socrates gave philosophy a method of finding the truth, while Plato offered a perfectionist vision of the truth inside the mind. Now these two came together in Aristotle to provide a basis for modern Western philosophy, a progressive, perfectionist vision of truth-seeking, a single truth. Aristotle While Plato sat inside a cave saying that to find the truth, reasoning was superior to real-world observation, his student Aristotle, however, reversed this by getting his hands dirty and dissecting the frogs and gazing at stars to understand the real world. Aristotle, who lived between 384 and 322 BCE, argued that truth is not inside us, but it's on the outside in the real world. 
Truth, in other words, is in the world around us. His method was evidence-based research akin to modern science. He actually went to the fields to study animals and sea creatures. He questions Plato's ideal form, saying that if a man is the model of an ideal form, who is the ideal form model of? It's the same argument, if God created us, who created God and who created the God that created God, which goes to infinity. Aristotle put human senses to work and argued that our observation of things is the best way to find the truth. He said everything in the world can be categorized by their substance, quantity, place, time and so forth. Today modern science classifies animals into species, earth into continents and oceans, rocks and minerals. This categorization helps humans to gain knowledge much faster and more effectively. He famously said humans are rational animals. Aristotle also said that everything has a purpose or a telos or an end goal. The purpose of this video is to educate people about philosophy. As a result, Aristotle's telos has become a branch of philosophy called teleology that looks at things through their purpose, not their essence. So when we look at a chair, we don't think of the wood and trees and forests, but we think of sitting on it. A chair is to be sat on, not considered a piece of tree. So Aristotle's telos put purpose before essence. As a result, Western philosophy is a very purpose-driven way of thinking which emphasizes something's utility or use before its essence. As a result, Western cultures value solution to problems, efficiency and pragmatism that make things better. Today, modern science develop useful technology, so it's heavily utility based. We like useful things. The purpose of science is to develop technology to make life easier. What is the purpose of human civilization? To reach perfection, which is a kind of Aristotelian teleology. So Aristotle's telos coincided with the Christian view that we are heading towards an apocalypse or heaven, a perfectionist utopia where you are happy and blissful. In science, we are heading towards a perfect understanding of the universe and life. So telos allows us to make plans, have goals and strive towards something. Without an end goal, it is hard to motivate ourselves to do things. Just like Plato, he also set up a school called Lyceum where he gathered all the best minds of his generations to study. One of his most famous students prior to the Lyceum was a man who took his teleological teaching to conquer the world. It was of course Alexander the Great who made it all the way to India in his attempt to conquer the world. I should point out an important Greek philosopher who lived outside the rationality dominated school. It was Epicurus whose philosophy centered on happiness, not rationality or truth. So instead of an academy or school, he set up a hippie style garden where he gathered his friends to talk philosophy while enjoying life in peace and tranquility. Epicurus understood that the biggest enemy of happiness is also the main reason human invented philosophy. What is it? The fear of death. The entire foundation of human philosophy rests on this mystery. Epicurus had a very clever answer. He said the fear of death is irrational. It makes no sense. Why? For the simple reason that we do not know death. Not only that, we cannot know death. Because nobody has returned from death to tell us what it is. Death is just one way street. Now that we know the fact that we do not and cannot know death, why fear it? We are afraid of lions because we know they can eat us. We are afraid of fire because we know the pain. But we cannot and will not know death. It's totally irrational to be afraid of it. Instead of worrying about death, we should make the most of this life by living in and spreading peace and happiness among others. Later, his philosophy was adapted into utilitarianism to maximize happiness for the majority of people. But despite his philosophy of happiness, Epicurus remains an outsider in Western philosophy. So to sum up, Socrates questioned people on the streets of Athens to critically examine things in life. Plato sat inside a cave, not literally though, and asked himself about the ideal form that may have come from God or the human mind. While Aristotle went to the field and got his hands dirty to understand the natural world. Socrates placed virtue in knowledge and rational truth while rejecting passion, emotions or faith as dogmatic. This was Nietzsche's biggest problem with Western philosophy which he squarely blamed on Socrates. Too much rationality ignores human passion and heavily relies on reason which is rigid, inflexible, that turns us into machines. Plato however retreated to himself and argued that perfectionist doesn't exist on the outside but only on the inside in our head. 
The world is a terrible place precisely because it's a skewed model of a perfect form that only exists in our mind. Plato's ideas were closer to the religious idea of God, so later Christians and Muslims interpreted Plato's perfect form as God. God is perfect, while humans in the world are imperfect images of God. Aristotle said forget about the imperfect world, someone has to go to the field to study the bloody nature through observations and dissections, so his method was empirical science, which became the basis of medieval Islamic science and later 16th century European science. Next I'll talk about the three horses of Eastern philosophy, the Buddha, Lao Tzu and Confucius. Previously I discussed the Greek trio of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle who influenced Western philosophy. The three most famous Eastern philosophers were Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, and Confucius, the founder of Confucianism. I'll mainly focus on their philosophies and less on their religious practices, which are quite different in different countries. Eastern philosophical tradition is very rich and complex, so these three philosophers can help us shed lights on Eastern spirituality. Lao Tzu Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu lived in 6th century BCE in China is said to be the author of the Tao Te Ching or Tao Te Ching which is the foundational text of Taoism, a philosophy that traces its origin to shamanism and hermeticism. Taoism which is also sometimes called Taoism literally means the way or the enlightened path or nature's way which is a spontaneous, eternal and an unnameable and undefinable. Quote, nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. It is simply the flow of the universe, such as gravity allowing rivers to flow downward without an effort. The core idea of Taoism is the doctrine of Wu Wei, which can be translated as non-resistance or action through inaction. Wei means purposeful and intentional, while Wu means there is no or lacking. So literally it means there is no purposeful act. A good metaphor for humans to live their lives by is river, which the Chinese civilizations relied on. Rivers flow downward. If hindered by a rock, instead of moving the rock, they flow around it. This means we should live our lives in alignment or harmoniously with nature, not against nature. Another important idea of Taoism is yin and yang or good and evil which live together inside everyone as we all have the dark and light. You cannot separate the two. I think this fundamentally differs from a western religion so good and evil are thought to be separate entities. However, according to Taoism, there are two sides of the same coin. Everything is neither completely negative nor positive, but a bit of both. In other words, a saint has his sins and a sinner has his redeeming qualities. In Taoism, humans are one manifestation of the Tao or the Wei. You could say just one species among millions of other species. Lao Tzu emphasized not to follow one's desires, goals or ambitions but rather find your natural flow. Ziyan which literally means naturally is a Taoist value which emphasizes natural creativity and spontaneity. As a result Taoism is seen as the religion of the artists who live a more intuitive and spontaneous life that mimics nature's flow. You could even make a connection between Carl Jung's psychology of the collective subconscious, deeply embedded memories of our species or those species before that artists tap into by finding the flow of nature. This artistic flow is much more elaborated in another book titled Zhuangzi, supposedly authored by another important figure in Taoism, a man called Zhuangzi. The book has many humorous stories, allegories and anecdotes, with the most famous one being the butterfly dream, in which Zhuangzi wakes up one morning from a dream in which he turned into a butterfly. Now he is perplexed and asks this mind-blowing question, was he dreaming of a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming Zhuangzi? The answer is not important here but the question itself is the main point. We humans seek clear answers and clarity but nature doesn't care about separate entities or separation of different species. Nature is one big 
perpetual flow. From nature's perspective, a human and butterfly are simply two different manifestations of the same thing. Even the state of being awake and dreaming are false distinctions or dichotomy because they are one and the same thing. For example, artists, novelists, musicians often dream or daydream their best works because they find the flow of nature's collective subconsciousness. Laozi is said to have lived during the Zhu dynasty, whose capital was close to the Yellow River, therefore the river is often used as a metaphor for Taoism. Later in life, Laozi is said to have traveled west, where he rode Dao De Jing and some remote mountains and then vanished into thin air. Also a great metaphor and how to flow in life like the wind and river. Today Laozi's ideas are extremely important but also deeply embedded into the cultures of China, Korea and Japan. To give you an example, people in Japan tend to be less confrontational, tend to avoid conflict, which fits in with the Taoist idea of non-resistance. So to sum up, Laozi or Taoism philosophy centers on the idea of not going against the natural flow but flowing with it. Not resisting nature's way but going with it. Buddha. Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha lived a luxurious life in a rich northern Indian family between 563 and 483 BCE. But he wasn't happy. He learned that suffering was universal among the poor, rich, young and old men and women. But why do we suffer? The reason we suffer is because of our desires for pleasure. The more we get, the more we want. If we have a big house, next time we will not be fulfilled if we don't get an even bigger house. Bigger cars, more partners, more wealth, friends, subscribers, followers. At no point in our life we can satisfactorily say it is enough. A good example is addiction. If a small dose makes you high today, but you need a larger dose to give you the same high a month later or a year later. In other words, as you experience more, your desires also grow bigger. So life is just an endless cycle of desire, fulfillment of that desire and more desires. How do you solve this problem? To ease suffering, according to Buddhism, we should nip our wants in the bud by detaching ourselves from our desires for worldly positions. Don't chase things and be happy in the moment. But it's easier said than done. Everyone says it's a good idea to be content with what you have right now. But curbing your desire is not an easy job. Why is it so hard? Here's when Buddhism gets really interesting and profoundly deep. We all think we are who we are. We have a sense of the self we call me and you. We think it's somewhat solid entity. In Western religions, this self is imparted to us from God. It's real. This individual self is genuine and for the most part unchangeable. According to Buddhism, however, you are wrong. Why? The self or ego is not real. It's just an illusion or a mirage or a temporary imposter attached to your body. You could say like a parasite it lives on you. What does it do inside us? This imposter self fuels our desires, ambitions and goals. In other words, it uses us to go out in the world and achieve things, but at the end of the day we still don't feel fulfilled. Especially when we achieve everything and death hits us. We lose our shit because we went to so much trouble acquiring our wealth, fame, power and now death is snatching all away from us. It's a bad deal. So what is the solution Mr. Buddha? His answer might shock you. According to Buddhism, to be truly enlightened and blissful, you have to achieve the nirvana stage, which means we must kill the imposter self. This thing we call the self or ego is the source of all our desires. To not desire anything, we must remove the self. According to Buddhism, our soul is the real thing and also very much universal, while the self is a kind of picture we put in our head every time we are born and our various reincarnations. One way to understand this is perhaps through Mr. Plato, who also said that the idea of things is the perfect form and the real things on the outside is a mere shadow of the real thing. In Buddhism, your soul is genuine, eternal and universal, while your body or ego are temporary and fleeting. We're not separate from the universe, but a tiny part of a big whole. To become happy and one with the universe, you must detach yourself from your desires and kill the self through meditation, solitude and rigorous physical and mental discipline. Quote, a disciplined mind brings happiness. 
This is very similar to Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy of the blind universal will, which is a force beyond our control, yet it rules most of what we do in life. There is a disagreement whether Schopenhauer reached the same conclusion independent of Buddhism or Hinduism, or he was influenced by these Indian philosophies. I'll discuss Schopenhauer's philosophy in more detail later on. So according to Buddhism, to be truly enlightened is to not see yourself as a separate self, but part of a bigger whole part of conscious universe. So true inner peace comes not from outside, for example by achieving your goals, but from inside once you become enlightened. Buddha's teachings through various forms of Buddhism are incredibly important in most of East Asia. Buddhism has also become one of the most influential philosophies in the West too, as it emphasizes individual inner journey rather than collective prayers in a church. So to sum up, Buddha was a rich, powerful prince, but wasn't fulfilled in life, and realized that all humans suffer because of our desires. To ease suffering, we should detach ourselves from our desires, and to be truly blissful, we should eliminate the self or ego through meditation and mental discipline. Confucius. While both Lao Tzu and the Buddha escaped society for some solitude and inner peace, Confucius, who lived between 551 and 479 BCE, however, tried to solve the practical socio-political questions like how we can live politically and socially together in peace and harmony, or how to organize society in a way that is peaceful. So his philosophy is less individualistic but more concerned about the collective existence, especially in big cities and countries. To find a great solution for socio-political coexistence, Confucius looked at how nature organizes things, especially in the animal kingdom. One of the biggest problems and the main source of wars and violence in human society is when there is confusion as to who stands where, who gets what, who owns what, who is responsible for what. He understood that the best method was the natural hierarchy or a pyramid social system. Without an established system of hierarchy or authority, there is chaos and confusion. And hierarchy allows everyone to know their place, so there is no confusion or conflict as to which chair belongs to who. Removing social confusion was Confucius's main task, pun intended. Now, not only everyone knows their own place, they also know other people's places too. So instead of a police watching everyone or patrolling the whole society, now everyone can watch each other. If someone sits in the wrong chair, other people can tell him it is not his seat. So if everyone knows their place, everyone can watch everyone, so nobody dares to disrupt the social harmony. So kings at the top of the pyramid and everyone else take their place based on their ranks and age, just like a game of chess. Perhaps the most logical game humans have invented. Confucius also realized that everything starts in the family, because it's the first line of defense against chaos. A solid family structure means a solid foundation for society. Inside the family, the man is at the top, then wife, then sons, and then daughters. One of the most common criticism against Confucius is the possibility of tyranny. Those in positions of power can abuse it. Confucius also emphasized responsibility and duty. Those at the top are responsible to protect those below them. A king is responsible to keep people safe and a man in the family is responsible to protect and provide for his wife and children. Those below in return are loyal and follow their superiors and do as asked. To understand Confucianism, you should look things not just from an individual point of view, but from a collective perspective. For example, if your body parts didn't function in alignment with the rest of your body, you are sick and needs treatment. Society is the same. If one or few members push things in the opposite direction, there is violence, which is a social illness. You might think it's pretty outdated, but you would be surprised that this Confucian hierarchy is pretty efficient system which is at work in modern companies. Because we hear this cliche that no work is done by a committee, which is true in most situations. Most corporate structures follow a strict and rigid hierarchy and a chain of command. In the animal kingdom, a hierarchy is often achieved through violence. But Confucian says since it's natural, we might as well adopt it to reduce violence. Of course, in the modern age, revolutions are a common occurrence. Those at the bottom rebel against the establishment. That's why Confucius emphasized duty and responsibility. When a ruler becomes tyrannical, he fails his duty. It all comes down to respecting your role in society. Quote, Without feelings of respect, what is there to distinguish men from beasts? 
Today, China, Korea, and Japan have adopted these Confucian methods in, in sorting out social situation where seniority and juniority plays a major role in schools, universities, and companies. Loyalty and respect are significant in Confucianism, but also meritocracy. As a result, traditionally, China had a strict civil service examination for centuries, and only the very bright and intelligent were recruited for high military and government jobs. In the 20th century, however, Mao Zedong, the egalitarian socialist, tried to dismantle the Confucian class hierarchy through the Cultural Revolution. That caused great pain for a lot of people. But of course, the Chinese Communist Party replaced the old class-based Confucian hierarchy with a political hierarchy. Many economists attribute China's rapid economic development to this efficient hierarchical system as China was run like a company, the president being the CEO of China. Things get done quickly, but of course, it also comes at a cost of many voices being suppressed. Traditionally, the Chinese Communist Party used to distance itself from the archaic Confucius philosophy because it contradicts the egalitarian philosophy of socialism in which everyone is equal and there is no hierarchy, at least on paper. But in reality, every human society has been hierarchical. Even today, China is slowly moving towards a more Confucian philosophy. As China is developing, not only it's utilizing a Confucian hierarchy for its efficiency, but it's also cultivating a more robust culture of meritocracy and traditional masculinity which were centered on Confucian philosophy. To sum up, Laozi's teaching is not to resist or destroy or go against nature, but to flow with nature. As a result, he says we should be more intuitive and spontaneous. In other words, humans are of nature, so it's time we forget our humanness and live in the flow of nature. The Buddha taught that suffering is universal because of our goals, desires, and ambitions. To find true peace is to look inside, not outside material success. And to be truly happy is to kill your ego or the self that has ambition and desires. Confucius tackled the socio-political question of how to live a peaceful coexistence through a hierarchical system in which everyone knows their place and position in society. While the Greeks were questioning truth, authority, poking holes at the natural world to understand its property, those in the East were seeking a harmonious life with nature, not only with other humans, but with all creatures on Earth. The Greeks disagreed with each other while the Asians tried to find agreement, consensus, not only among humans, but also between between humans and the natural world. The fact these three figures founded a religion of their own, while the three Greeks did not, show the fundamental difference between Eastern and Western philosophy. In the East, societies are generally more group-centered, while in the West it's more individual-centered. But if you really think about it, the philosophies of these three Eastern thinkers is highly individualized. They put the emphasis on the individual to take charge of themselves. Don't change the world change yourself. So while Eastern social fabric is communitarian, the philosophies are individualistic as they put demands on the individual to take responsibility for changing themselves. So they adapt to the society they live in. Don't change others but yourself. Don't change nature but yourself. The Greeks however focus on how to change nature as quickly, efficiently as possible. So in the West, individuality is static, God-given or born while social fabric is dynamic. In other words, in Western philosophy, the individual is solid and the society and nature malleable and changeable. In the East, however, nature is, as well as society's fabrics are static, while the individual is changeable. In other words, do not attempt to change others or nature because it's easier to change yourself. If you cannot fit in with others, take a good look at yourself and find what's wrong with you. People in the East are less likely to complain about the world, instead try to adapt to the world. Before you complain that I'm generalizing too much, sit back and relax and look at yourself in the mirror. Don't worry, I'm kidding. Next, I'll discuss two distinct approaches to philosophy. Animalism, that sees humans as animals, therefore needed to be herded to bring order. And humanism, that sees all humans as equal to one another. In other words, elitism versus egalitarianism, or carnivorous versus herbivorous philosophies. Previously, I discussed Eastern philosophy versus Western philosophy and how one employed rationality to tame nature while the other employed spirituality to tame the individual. 
Today, I'll look at two core philosophical schools, humanism versus animalism. Humanism is a belief that humans are somewhat special, either created by God or not. Therefore, the purpose of any society is to protect all humans equally. Humanism is also called egalitarianism, with a few babies of its own like socialism, feminism, liberalism, and postmodernism. Elitism or animalism, on the other hand, is a belief that some humans are more equal than others, especially the rulers, kings, elite class of people, or the talented people as in meritocracy. This is because hierarchy is very much part of the animal kingdom. The strongest wins the race. But as human civilization has progressed and we have become more efficient in taming nature, the historical trend is moving towards a more egalitarian human society. So here's the most important question. Was Karl Marx right that the future is communism? But first let me explain the history of these two divergent philosophical approaches and introduce some of the most important philosophers on each side. Humanism has its roots in religions. In the West, Christianity and Judaism at its core believed that all human beings were equal in the eye of God. Augustine of Hippo believed all humans have free will to choose between good and evil. He also said that one should love everyone equally. Quote, the measure of love is to love without measure. Thomas Aquinas, another Christian philosopher, argued that God created the world and all humans were equal, especially in freedom. Could, by nature, all men are equal in liberty, but not in other endowments. Outside the religious tradition, the first true humanist might be Mozi, who lived in the 4th century BC in China. He advocated a kind of universal humanism. At the time, Confucianism was the dominant philosophy in China, in which society was divided based on ranks and hierarchies. So Mozi believed in universal reciprocation. Quote, universal love is really the way of the sage kings. It is what gives peace to the rulers and sustenance to the people. This is an early form of humanism. Another early figure was a 6th century Persian philosopher Mazdat, who promoted economic equality among all people. He even protested against the rich having many wives, while the poor having no wife. His idea became quite influential in the Persian Empire, but soon fizzled out. On the opposite of humanism, we have the school of elitist philosophy, who, which we can term as realism, as it's called in politics. The basic idea of realism is that humans are chaotic and erratic animals that need to be tamed and controlled and ruled, not through honesty or fairness, but through deception or brute force. One of the earliest realist philosophers was San Tzu, who lived in China between 544 and 496 BC. In his famous book, The Art of War, he employs nature's tactics such as camouflage, deception, and even submission to survive or dominate others, especially in wars. His philosophy was to win at all costs, so to speak. For him, life is not about fairness or equality, it was about winning, which is at the heart of evolutionary biology. You only survive or thrive if you win nature's battle and overcome hurdles. Some of his strategies in the art of war are socially counterintuitive like this. Like he says, you must appear small when you're big and appear big when you're small in order to deceive your enemy. In Sun Tzu's art of war, honesty is the worst policy. Quote, when the enemy is relaxed, make them toil. When full, starve them. When settled, make them move. In other words, stand tall when you're small and sit small when you're tall. These are some basic survival tactics in the wild. For example, in the battle between the carnivores and herbivores. A gazelle jumps higher to show its health so the cheetahs don't bother chasing them. Some of the tactics are also to throw off your enemy, like when negotiating, ask for less when you want more, which is still in use in corporate capitalism. The art of war's basic rules are to know yourself, your enemy, and your environment, time your attack, and truce, while at the same time make sure your enemy knows nothing truthful about you. Be a peacock when small, and be a mouse when big. So this is the earliest form of political deception in order to prolong your rule over others. The winners are those who lie the best. So Sun Tzu borrowed his philosophy from the animal kingdom where there is no morality, only winners. Machiavelli, who lived between 1469 and 1527, was an Italian thinker who is famous for his book The Prince. 
in which he advises the rulers to use any methods available to them to achieve the goal of, of maximizing their power and domination over other humans. In other words, the famous line that the end justifies the means, which goes contrary to the humanist and religious morality of protecting life. Quote, it's better to be feared than love if you cannot be both. He argued that a ruler must be like a savage lion when needed and a cunning fox when needed. So brute force combined with cunning deceptions are needed in order to rule over society. Why? Because humans are savages and they're waiting for your weakest moment to strike and take away your power like Hamlet's uncle in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Machiavelli lived a few centuries before Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, but he still understood the savage nature of human politics. In other words, morality is for the weak and power and deception are for the strong. Quote, he who wishes to be obeyed must know how to command. In order to prevent a rebellion, a ruler must show terror and fear for its subject to behave well. Those at the top of society have the most to lose, so they can use any means available to them to make sure they keep their power and wealth. They use the police, the legal system and whatever else so nobody can take those things away from them. So just like Sansu, Machiavelli based his philosophy on the animal kingdom. It's not about equality or fairness, it's about winning and conquering. Thomas Hobbes was an English philosopher who lived between 1588 and 1679. In his book Leviathan, he argued that humans are savages and only a civilized state can protect humans from each other. In other words, humans have established states to escape the brutality of nature. According to him, humans are physical machines and nature, but when entering society, they gave up their savage tendencies and power to live peacefully. Quote, Life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. The fear of violence is always there. To escape it, humans have made a contract with their governing rulers. In return for their obedience and freedom, the state provides them with peace, justice, protection for them and their property. Just like Machiavelli, Hobbes believed in the use of force to tame people. Quote, not believing in force is the same as not believing in gravitation. Despite his argument for a civilized state, he understood that humans were in essence savage animals. So Sun Tzu drew on the animal kingdom saying deception was better than honesty. Machiavelli went even further saying that deception combined with brute force are justified to tame humans. Hobbes argued a civilized state has every right to tame the unruly humans. Now let's look at a few philosophers who oppose this animalistic philosophy based on the natural world. These philosophers saw human life as someone sacred. Voltaire, who lived between 1694 and 1777, was a French philosopher who believed in a kind of universal individual liberty, not tyranny as Machiavelli suggested. Unlike Machiavelli's iron rule, he believed in open skepticism and freedom of expression for all, so anyone could criticize and even rebel against the dominant traditions and dogmas. Quote, men are equal, it's not birth, but virtue that makes the difference. In other words, he didn't support the idea that the rulers and kings had a birthright authority over truth or liberty. The church or the state should not hold absolute power. Instead, everyone, despite their socioeconomic status, deserves the right to have an education and access to knowledge. Today, liberal democracies in the West follow the principles of free speech and individual autonomy, ideas that were promoted by Voltaire, so he's often considered the father of liberal individualism, because he believed everyone, irrespective of their socioeconomic class, deserved to be equally free. So nature works with hierarchy, but Voltaire argued that every human deserves equal freedom to express themselves. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who lived between 1712 and 1778, was born in Geneva. Unlike Thomas Hobbes, who said man is born savage but tamed in society, Rousseau believed that humans are naturally good but they are contaminated or tainted in society to act terrible. He famously said, man is born free, yet he is everywhere in chains. 
This was especially true in big cities where people turned selfish. He believed in the country people were naturally nicer, friendlier, and fairer. But once people migrated to the cities instead of becoming more civilized, ironically they turned into selfish animals. Unlike Hobbes' top-down approach, Rousseau believed in a bottom-up approach, arguing that the masses should be able to run the state, not some select individuals like kings and generals. His famous book, The Social Contract, is said to have influenced the French Revolution in 1789, in which the anti-monarchy revolutionaries toppled the king and France became a republic. Of course, it didn't last very long, but it sowed the seed of freedom, equality, and brotherhood, which resulted in three major ideologies of socialism, liberalism, and nationalism, which have dominated politics for centuries ever since. So Rousseau's egalitarian approach had a huge influence in political history. So to sum up, the humanists argue that since life is too short, let's all be more equal, fairer, and nicer to each other. Mosey argued for an equal universal education, Rousseau for equal political participation, and Voltaire for equal freedom for everyone to express himself. Political animalists or elitists, on the other hand, argue that since life is too short, it's all about winning, conquering, and dominating others. So they don't trust all humans, therefore promoted a more robust political regime that didn't allow people to be free to challenge the ruler or the state. Sun Tzu used deception, Machiavelli justified repression, and Hobbes promoted the state as a tool to control human savages. Now, as a historical trend, we are moving towards an egalitarian humanist future, at least in principle. Also, this was Karl Marx's prediction that slowly we are heading towards a communist utopia. In reality, however, all human societies are highly unequal and hierarchical and it's unlikely that this will change for a foreseeable future. Humanism invented by humans, while elitism or animalism invented by nature and evolutionary biology. We are all born unequal in beauty, talent, intellect, and physical strength, which contribute to societies being dominated by those who are naturally blessed, either with talent or beauty. But despite nature not being helpful in producing us equally, there is a deep desire among humans for equality, fairness, and justice. You could say that humankind is called kind for a reason. As human civilization has improved and the more we have tamed nature, we have become more confident that a humanist utopia is possible. So in recent centuries, egalitarian philosophy has become more dominant, which a few centuries back must have been unthinkable. Socialist experiments showed the failure of egalitarianism in Russia, but the idea is still pretty strong in the world. Who knows in the future, humans might produce human babies in labs who are identical in all attributes to create a truly egalitarian utopia. Once you produce baby outside the natural process, equality is a lot easier to achieve. Identical babies produce identical adults. A brave new world kind of world. But will we be happy? Next, I'll discuss the battle between pursuing knowledge and pursuing happiness. In other words, those who pursue knowledge to gain power and those who pursue happiness and peace to live a simpler life. Previously, I discussed the two philosophical approaches to organizing society, egalitarian humanism versus hierarchical elitism. Here, I'll discuss a fundamental question about the meaning of life. Are we here to know the world or be happy? Are we here to seek knowledge or happiness? So in this segment, I'll look at a few important philosophers. On the knowledge side, I'll look at the philosophy of Francis Bacon, Martin Heidegger, and Michel Foucault. On the happiness side, I'll look at the philosophy of Erasmus, Michel Montaigne, and Bertrand Russell. As I discussed earlier, philosophy is concerned mainly with two questions. Ontology asks what is out there, and epistemology asks how we know it. So knowledge is fundamental to philosophy. You could say we humans are hardwired to see, understand, analyze, and interpret the world. In other words, we are curious creatures, so the development of modern science is just the byproduct of this curiosity, and our thirst for knowledge drives innovation and social change. But we are also creatures who seek happiness. While knowledge can empower us, it doesn't make us happy. While knowledge can transform our lives, it doesn't guarantee happiness or peace of mind. As I discussed earlier, the first philosopher to methodically seek the truth was Socrates. 
and later Aristotle improved it by giving the approach a scientific and empirical tinge to it. But it wasn't until centuries later the scientific approach was perfected in Europe, mainly in 15th and 16th centuries through the works of scientists such as Copernicus, Galileo and Newton. During this period, the English philosopher and scientist and politician Francis Bacon, who lived between 1561 and 1626, looked at knowledge from an empirical point of view. He graduated from Cambridge University and is often considered the first empiricist, a school of philosophy later developed by other British philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume. Bacon placed the source of knowledge in our experience through our senses. At the time, the church held the view that knowledge came from God and science was challenging that. Church relied on people not knowing and not questioning things. When nobody knows things, the church could control information and become the source of knowledge. Today, you could say that big media companies have the same mindset. But Francis Bacon understood the power of knowledge and wanted to educate everyone because he believed that through knowledge you could empower the poor so they could live better lives. This is an early idea of public education, which today we take for granted. Bacon understood that humans are on the one hand knowledge seekers, but on the other hand humans also have some blind spots like religious belief, tribal affiliations and love of many, which prevent us from getting to the truth. Another problem we have as humans is that we project our own limited experience to the world. Bacon argued that science, however, doesn't look at an individual, but looks at the majority to generalize. It's through generalization that you get closer to the truth. For instance, if one person experiences something, it's subjective and unreliable. But if let's say 10, 20, 100 or more people experience the same thing, then you can generalize and make science out of it. Understanding generality is an immense power according to Francis Bacon. So knowledge not only opens the knower's mind, it also empowers them to change their lives for the better. Of course, Bacon lived at a time when people had very little, so education and knowledge could transform a person's life immeasurably. Desiderius Erasmus, who lived between 1466 and 1536, was a Dutch philosopher who wrote a very influential book called In Praise of Folly. Unlike Francis Bacon, Erasmus argued to be happy, naivety and ignorance are far more important than knowing. For him, the purpose of life is not to gain power, but to be content. He was writing at a time when Europe was waking up to have a renaissance, a resurgence in scientific and rational pursuit, which went against the teachings of the church to have faith in God. Erasmus, a Christian himself, while criticizing the corruption in the Catholic Church, argued that to be happy, a little faith and ignorance were vitally important. His philosophy was taken up by fiction writers such as Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, and later the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky. The goal of life is not to know everything, but to lead a simple life. Knowledge or power doesn't make you happy, but simplicity and folly do. It's the old adage that ignorance is bliss, which goes completely counter to the age of the enlightenment and rationality. So Erasmus said that being an idiot was the surest way to be happy. Michel de Montaigne, who lived between 1533 and 1592, was a French philosopher who had a very curious childhood. Although born into a wealthy family, he spent his first three years of childhood in the house of a peasant, so he could learn the life of the poor. This must have had a profound influence on him later in life. If Erasmus said folly was a good medicine for happiness, Montaigne argued that to be happy, one should have a simple life. Instead of seeking the company of many people, one should try to live a more solitary life, because society can corrupt you, either morally or intellectually. In today's social media world of chasing likes and online attention and validation, his message resonates with a lot of people. We always try to seek the validation of our peers like some addictive drug to an extent that we are never satisfied. Montaigne says to have a peaceful life, don't chase other people's approval or glory or fame, which makes us pretentious and fake most of the time. He argued that attention seekers are not original thinkers, but rather suffers from herd mentality or tribalism, which in the heat of the crowd or moment turns us into mobs. We commit horrendous crimes and only later realize how stupid it was. 
To prevent becoming a mob, Montaigne argued once you disentangle yourself from the group, crowd or mobs, you develop a clarity of mind or inner tranquility. It's not only good for your happiness, but it's also good for your intellectual and moral integrity, because solitude allows you to develop yourself. To have a lasting name, writers and artists should not be bogged down to social, political and tribal issues of the day. Montaigne's idea of solitude also inspired Friedrich Nietzsche, who was extremely critical of the masses or mobs or tribal thinking. I'll discuss Nietzsche later on. As modernity made mass education the norm and the crowded city's habitat for the majority of people, life's meaning became even more acute for the modern man. Knowledge of the world wasn't enough to have a meaningful life. We needed something else. Martin Heidegger, who lived between 1889 and 1976, was a German philosopher who turned the lens onto himself. Francis Bacon, like Aristotle, was interested in knowing the outside world, but Heidegger, like Diogenes of Sinop, wanted to know the human being itself. In his famous book, Being in Time, instead of asking what human being is, he asked how it is like to be human. What is that experience like? Why? The simple answer is that we are scientists who happen to be also the subject of science. When you study animals, we are outsiders. But when we study human beings, we are insiders. Heidegger didn't want to have an abstract answer. Instead, he wanted to know to have a concrete answer to the question of being, which is incidentally the root of the word ontology in Greek. So what is his answer? Heidegger measured life as a finite phenomena, starting at birth, and ending in death. Just a line that has a beginning and an end. Now, unlike other animals, we know death. We even anticipate it. The knowledge of death makes us anxious and fearful, so to cope, we tend to not think about it on a daily basis. It's either a coping mechanism or simply we do not have time to think about it every day as we are busy with work and life. So we are the being who is aware of death, but we also try not to think about it. That's precisely Heidegger's answer. Human beings, or being in general, is to be aware of death. Instead of making us anxious or depressed, he thinks it empowers us. This knowledge of death gives our life authenticity and meaning. So if Bacon said knowledge of the world empowers us to better our life physically, Heidegger says the knowledge of death gives our life meaning and empowers us to live fully and authentically. Bertrand Russell, who lived between 1872 and 1970, was a British philosopher who was deeply steeped in the logical and mathematical side of philosophy, like just like Ludwig Wittgenstein, whom he influenced. He used a logical and rational approach to argue that to be happy, one should work less. You could say he is responding to Marx, who argued that workers are exploited by the rich. But he's also responding to the Northern European work ethics, which states that work is morally good in itself. Therefore, this morality, according to some, was responsible for the modern capitalism. Russell, however, argued that seeing work as a morally good thing was not only irrational, but it also made a few people very rich while the majority very unhappy. Why? Because not all kinds of work are the same. Some are good and some are not good. Some are meaningful and some are not. To bundle all as a good thing is not logical. He concluded that working less increases human happiness. So instead of working yourself to death, you should enjoy life more. Do other activities. Today, a lot of people are so busy working long hours that they lose sight of their well-being and happiness. This is especially true for men because we are so drawn to numbers just like Bertrand Russell was. We watch growth graphs and become obsessed with it. We work one day and then extrapolate that to a week, a month and then a year. So if we work this many days, we will have this much money or as a result we lose sight of the fact that life is meant to be lived, not work to death. So Russell argued that to be happy, work less. He lived to be 90 years old. Michel Foucault, who lived between 1926 and 1984, was a French philosopher. Unlike Bacon and Heidegger, he saw knowledge as a cynical tool of repression. Foucault looked at modernity through the lens of Nietzsche, saying that modern rationality wasn't liberating humans, but creating a more robust change controllers. 
He famously studied the prison system and how prisons are designed to control us either directly through imprisonment or indirectly through the fear of it. He argued that those who have access to science and knowledge use it to discipline the rest of us through the education system as well as the legal system. Foucault argued that knowledge is a tool, science is a tool, rationality is a tool, but mostly for the powerful elite because they have access to all of them, while the majority of us are subjects. Michel Foucault was also inspired by Immanuel Kant, whose epistemological revolution argued that our knowledge of reality is not totally objective, but rather we see the world the way we see because we impose our own mental structure on the world. Foucault even argued that man or mankind itself is a recent invention. So to sum up, on the knowledge side, Francis Bacon understood that our knowledge of the world could empower us to better our lives. Heidegger argued that our knowledge of death can give our life more meaning and authenticity. Foucault, however, said everything is invented, there is nothing solid to understand. Knowledge is just a tool for power to manipulate nature and other humans. So to sum up on the happiness side, Erasmus argued that folly, ignorance or naivety is a good thing to have to lead a happier life. We have all seen children. When we grow older, we lose that naivety and become a bit more miserable. Montaigne argued that don't follow the crowd and seek some solitude to cultivate your own inner peace. Don't seek validation from others like a drug addict. The higher you go, the more you seek to get high and higher. No mountain is high enough. So listen to Montaigne because he came down the mountain to settle in a hut. Even his name means Montaigne, so climb yourself and your ego, not other people's validations. Bertrand Russell argued that work is not morally good or bad thing, so we should prioritize happiness over work. Work to live or live to work. I should really listen to this, but I want to have more subscribers. Monten, help. So knowledge can make your physical life better or make you more successful financially or boost your social standing, but it might decrease your overall happiness. Knowing things also makes us human very cynical about the world, just like Foucault said that all knowledge is power and all authorities want to suppress you. Naivety, on the other hand, might make your physical life harder as you don't have everything figured out, but it can also lead you to a more long-lasting happiness as you trust other people and rely on other people, which brings a level of sincerity in yourself and those around you. So knowledge makes you successful, but it could also make you cynical. While ignorance hinders your success, it could also lead to a more blissful life. What do you think? Next, I'll discuss the battle between rationalists and empiricists, leading to Immanuel Kant's great breakthrough in philosophical knowledge. Previously, I discussed the question whether our life purpose is to seek knowledge or seek happiness. In this segment, I'll look at one of the biggest battles in philosophy between the rationalists, mostly mainland Europeans, who argue that knowledge is somewhat innate inside us, and the empiricists, mainly British, who argue that knowledge comes from experience. Immanuel Kant brought the two together. If Western philosophy was a two-sided funnel, Kant would be the narrow part. So everything before him is squeezed through him, and after him, Hegel and Schopenhauer moved philosophy in two different directions. Hegel went historical and rational, while Schopenhauer went psychological and subconscious. I'll discuss these two philosophical approaches later on. Rationalism is a school of philosophy that relies on human reason to understand the world. Reason itself is an innate human property. In other words, we are born with the ability to reason, and early rationalists saw reason as God-given gift. The father of rationalism is René Descartes, who lived between 1596 and 1650. He was a French philosopher and a scientist who famously did his thought experiment. He sat down in his armchair and asked the simple question, what if everything we know is just a dream? Nothing exists in reality. In other words, to prove that he existed, he did the opposite. He doubted his own existence. Then he said if everything was a dream, the dreamer has to be real, otherwise there will be no dreaming without a dreamer, or doubt without a doubter. So he said the most famous line in philosophy, I think therefore I am. Even if you doubt your own existence, this doubt is real. According to Descartes, we get knowledge or ideas in three different ways. Some come from our experience, some drive from reason, and some ideas are innate inside us, presumably from God. So rationalists like René Descartes argue that we have an innate knowledge of the world and as we grow we simply unfold that knowledge to see things more clearly. 
In a way, rationalists are like Plato in saying that our knowledge of the world inside us and learning is just recollection of that innate knowledge. So the seed is inside us, not outside. The other famous rationalist was Gottfried Leibniz, who lived between 1646 and 1716. Today we know him more because of the famous argument he had with Isaac Newton over the invention of calculus. Leibniz, however, was a great philosopher who made a distinction between rational truth and factual truth. In other words, our knowledge of the world relies on our innate reason, but also on human experience. The things we experience on the outside builds on and solidifies our inner knowledge. For Leibniz, the human mind is a small representation of the entire universe. In other words, the human mind contains everything in the universe. If the universe is rational, then the human mind is a representation of that rationality. However, he conceded that human rationality is not always adequate to understand the world, so we need human experience to complement our rational faculties. One of the biggest problems for Leibniz was his belief in God, so he attempted to reconcile scientific empiricism with the idea of God, who knows it all. In doing so, Leibniz argued for two different forms of truth. The empirical truths we get through experiences add to our rational truth which we innately have or God given. So to sum up, rationalists argue that humans are naturally equipped to utilize reason to understand the world, with or without the need of observation or animal senses. In other words, we don't need experiences to know the world, we simply know it because for the most part God has imparted us with innate knowledge or ability of reasoning. Empiricists however disagree, saying that we understand the world not innately but through experience and empirical data we gather from the world through our human senses. Our mind is a blank slate without experience. John Locke, who lived between 1632 and 1704, argued Around the same time as Leibniz was a pioneer of empiricism who said that everything we know about the world has come to us from our experience. He gave the example of newborn babies to show that we humans have not a single idea from birth. We simply learn by observing and experiencing things. Quote, if we attentively consider newborn children, we shall have little reason to think that they bring many ideas into the world with them. Locke understood that while we may not have innate ideas from birth, we do have the ability to learn a language, which may be innate. This was later developed by Noam Chomsky in his famous theory of universal grammar that humans are hardwired to learn a language and its structure. So John Locke concluded that all knowledge we gain, we gain through experience. David Hume, who lived between 1711 and 1776, built on John Locke's idea of empirical experience as a source of knowledge and further argued that not only we understand the world through observation experiences, but we are also able to categorize things as a kind of customary habit which guides us through life. Hume argues that if you see a tree, then another, then another, at some point you see a pattern or category. This you call trees. We have no notion of trees from birth, we are like blank slates as babies and only through encounters with the outside world we begin to form knowledge of the outside world. The same with night and day, as you see the cycle being repeated, you begin to expect it as a kind of custom that night turns into day and day turns into night and the cycle becomes a customary knowledge. This over time becomes ideas and beliefs, over time they turn into what rationalists call innate knowledge. Hume says they are nothing but old impressions or perceptions over time. As knowledge is passed on from generation to generation, it may seem innate, which is nothing but someone's experience. So David Hume added custom as a kind of repeated experience or common knowledge and argued that we learn things from experience, it is not innate. So the rationalists believe we humans are equipped with some innate knowledge of the world at birth, while the empiricists argue that we are blank slates and only through our experiences we gain knowledge of the world. In other words, rationalists see knowledge flow from inside out, like a torch shedding light on the outside, while the empiricists see knowledge flow from outside like a window lighting a room. Here comes the German giant Immanuel Kant, who lived between 1724 and 1804. Kant took up the challenge of reconciling these two divergent schools of philosophy. To solve the problem between the rationalists and the empiricists, Kant devised a new theory that divided the world into two, phenomena and noumena. Phenomena is the world of experiences, how we understand the world through our bodily senses. 
things we see, hear, touch and smell and observe and study. Noumena, on the other hand, is a world in itself which we can never truly know. For example, we can touch and study a rock, but we cannot truly understand what it feels to be a rock. As a result, our knowledge of the rock is not complete, it's limited and partial. Kant argued that when we are receiving information through experience, however, we are not passive receivers. Instead, we humans also impose our own structures to the world. We categorize things into rocks, trees, animals and whatnot. The world we see is a reflection of a mental structure we put out to the world. Rocks and trees may not have any notion of being such, but humans have imposed such categories onto them. In other words, we are not passive knowledge receivers, but actively imposing our own structure on things. Now Kant brings the rationalists and empiricists together. Rationalists argue everything is inside us, while empiricists say everything is outside us. And Kant says we are sort of on the threshold of outside and inside. Like a kind of window glass in the middle of inside and outside. Our inner mental structure shapes how we experience the world. For example, a good analogy would be fishing. To catch a fish, a fisherman throws a net. If the holes in the net are too large, the fish escape. And if the net has no hole, it catches more water than fish. So the fish is the outside world while the net we throw is our mental structure we put out to capture the experience as knowledge. We humans probe the world through our innate mental structure which catches the outside experience based knowledge. So for Kant, reason and experience go hand in hand in understanding the world. Without the net, you cannot catch. You need both reason and experience to understand the world. These he called his Copernican revolution. Why? Because in the Middle Ages, people believed the sun was orbiting the earth and Copernicus said the earth is orbiting the sun. Kant did the same. Empirists say knowledge comes from outside and Kant says yes, but not only we actively seek the outside knowledge, but it also goes through us, so our mental structure determines reality on the outside. In other words, our human method puts a structure to the world that would not exist without humans. And this structure makes it easy for us to understand and manipulate the world. Imagine we're not human, we might have a very different understanding of the world. So to sum up, the rationalist thing reason is more important than experience in our pursuit of knowledge. Our reason is like a torch that allows us to see things. The empiricists however counter argue that experience is primary and reason is secondary. Our senses act like a window that lets light in so we understand things. Kant says we human are both a torch and a window because our mental structure allows us to experience and understand the world better, faster and more effectively. Without a good method or an effective tool and structure, our experiences are all over the place. The debate is still not over though. Despite Kant uniting the two epistemological approaches in philosophy, there are still people who think one way or another. Our modern science is leaning more to the empiricist camp, while most psychologists lean more towards all, not the rationalist, but the irrational subconscious or the unconscious in determining how we understand the world. So the debate has shifted from reason to passion, in some cases to intuition. It is not rationality, but intuition that allows us to understand the world. Next I'll discuss what motivates human action by looking at two of Kant's famous successors, who went in different directions. Schopenhauer went psychologically towards Eastern philosophy, while Hegel built his philosophy on history. On the one hand, we have Hegel, Marx, Sartre and others who explain human motivation through history and rationality. While on the other hand, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche relied on individual psyche and human passion to explain human motivation. Previously I discussed how Immanuel Kant bridged the two philosophical approaches to epistemology, rationalism and empiricism. So in Western philosophy, Kant is like a funnel. He influenced another two branches of philosophy that came after him which tried to answer some fundamental questions like what makes us who we are, what motivates our actions. Hegel's answer was history and rationality while his arch rival Schopenhauer's answer was the subconscious will. Hegel's philosophy went the sociological route basing human action on history and rationality while Schopenhauer's philosophy went the psychological route basing human motivation on the subconscious blind will. Or human passion. In this segment I'll look at sociology and rationality by discussing philosophers including Hegel, Marx, Sartre and Zizek, 
who argued that we are the product of history. But they didn't stop there. Since history makes us who we are, it's also our job to make history. So we're not only molded and shaped by the historical era in which we live in, but also through our own life choices. So social philosophy is built on the philosophy of progressive egalitarianism, stating that we are heading towards a perfectionist utopia on the one hand, and materialism stating that the most important aspect of human life is material success on the other. Of course, not all of them agreed on this. It's important to know that philosophers who came after Kant were in a sense responding to Kant because his breakthrough in bringing the rationalists and empiricists together was a huge moment in philosophy. George Hegel, who lived between 1770 and 1831, too responded to Kant. Hegel had two problems with Kant. First, Kant argued that we humans only understand the phenomena but we have no access to noumena or the thing in itself. We can touch a rock but we cannot fully understand it. For Hegel, this noumena world which we can never fully know looked like an empty abstraction, pure speculation based on Kant's own assumption. In other words, he just made it up by claiming that such a thing existed in the first place. Hegel's second problem with Kant was that he argued that our innate structure or categorization by which we interpret the world is fixed. In other words, we use a fishnet or a framework by which we catch a fish or experience, but the net or the framework is always fixed and nobody can change it. For the history buff Hegel, everything including human consciousness was subject to change through time. History has shown us that humans evolve, so do our tools including the fishnet or our ability to reason. In other words, everything has a history, even rock has a history, it changes through time. And humans are very much a product of a historical era. How do we change? Hegel says through dialectic processes. When two opposites collide, it makes a third thing that has a bit of both the original things, but it also has slightly different characters. Hegel says every phenomena or idea or thesis as he called it contains a contradiction within itself, which he called antithesis. And this conflict which is resolved in synthesis, or a new idea which is an improvement or different from the thesis and antithesis. Like a child has a characteristic of both parents but also different from both. This historical process continues in generating new theses and antithesis which lead to further synthesis and history continues. So according to Hegel, Kant was wrong in saying that human mental structure or reason does not change. For Hegel, everything is subject to change. It's important to know that Kant was a lot firmer in his religious belief than Hegel, which explains that Kant sees reason as a static while Hegel sees it as malleable and changeable through time. Another reason is of course the French Revolution, as well as the rise of Napoleon, which for the very first time in human history, ordinary people took power from the king and anyone could become Napoleon. So nothing was fixed. Kant, being a much older man, was furiously against any kind of revolution that could destabilize the status quo. For Hegel, the world has a history and we are for the most part the product of historical era. In other words, reality is a historical process, not constant. However, since we are the product of history, we can also affect the course of history through ideas that capture the spirit of an age. For example, Napoleon managed to influence history as he captured the spirit of 19th century Europe. People didn't believe in the absolute power of kings, so demanded change. Hegel can be characterized as a perfectionist rationalist, believing that history is moving towards perfection. Now Hegel only interpreted history, his student wanted to change history. Karl Marx, who lived between 1818 and 1883, learned a great deal from Hegel. He came to the conclusion that if we are the product of history, our history must be the product of those who came before us. Marx had a problem. Hegel was good at interpreting history, even at recognizing the people who were capable of changing, but Marx was more concerned about changing things for the good, especially for the disadvantaged majority who were the real force behind economic production, i.e. the working class. Marx said the history of our existence has been nothing but a continuous class struggle between the haves and have-nots, the powerful and the powerless, with the powerful enjoying it all and the powerless having a tough time of it. So Marx developed a philosophy of rational materialism arguing that material inequality was the root of all evils. He argued that humans are fundamentally motivated by material objects, so we are rational because we want material things. To solve this inequality, he adopted egalitarianism. 
For Marx, the perfectionist future utopia was an egalitarian society where you only worked for the hours that provided you enough subsistence and the rest of the time you could relax on the beach. You can also see traces of Christianity in Marxism, the fight between good and evil culminating in the weak, overthrowing the powerful and turning the world into a utopian communist heaven where everyone lives equally and happily ever after. But Marx was not religious, so he based his philosophy on rational materialism, in which all workers unite to overthrow the exploitative class and everyone lives in harmony and peace, and nobody starves. For Marx, not only communism was desirable, it was also historically inevitable, because for him, history was moving towards perfection through incremental improvement or dialectical change, as Hegel said. For example, feudalism was an improvement on hunter-gatherer societies. Capitalism was an improvement on feudalism. Socialism an improvement on capitalism. And finally, communism an improvement on socialism. And for Marx, communism was the final phase of human history. You couldn't make it any better. Just like heaven, you cannot create a heaven that is better than another heaven. Or maybe you could, but generally heavens tend to mean perfection. If they do exist, of course. Marx's class-based analysis had deep communitarian roots, or group-based. As a result, it failed in a highly individualized Europe, despite many attempts. For example, in the 1870s, Paris had a socialist revolution, but it didn't stick. Marxism found fertile soil in countries with strong communitarian bond, like Russia and China. So the 20th century witnessed many Marxist revolutions to move history in the right direction. These attempts had partial success, but ultimately failed to create a communist utopia. So Hegel talked about history in motion, Marx talked about how to speed up that historical motion. Both Hegel and Marx saw things from a society's perspective. Now I'll discuss how this history-based philosophy applies to a person's own individual history from birth to death. If a society has a history, so does an individual. Jean-Paul Sartre, who lived between 1905 and 1980, was a French existentialist philosopher. He was not a Marxist, but was hugely influenced by Marx and other Marxists, especially the Maoist movement in France. Hegel and Marx both agreed that humans are not only the product of history, we humans also serve the purpose of history. Hegel explained reality through a godlike spirit or idea, and Marx explained through a historical materialism and class struggle. In other words, both argue that we individuals are there to serve the grander mission or purpose, be it God or history or class struggle or general society. But what's the purpose of an individual human life? Sartre's existentialist philosophy argued that human life has no purpose because we are made neither by God nor by a blind force of history as Marx and Hegel outlined. Instead, we are made by our own history, choices we make in our own life. In other words, we have no essence or purpose from birth, we simply acquire it through our life, often through our own free choices and actions. Since we have no preordained purpose set for us by some other power like God or society, we are free to make mistakes to find our own purpose. Sartre even goes further by saying that we are condemned to be free and condemned to make mistakes, but this freedom comes with, you guessed it. As Uncle Ben said, it comes with responsibility. In other words, we are our own makers, we craft our own self-identity, therefore we have to live with what we make of ourselves. Unlike Hegel and Marx, Sartre liberates individuals from the constraints of God, history, traditions, class, and even human nature. So today, a new trend among homo sapiens is transgenderism, the idea that you can define your own gender identity based on your own feelings. People feel they are in the wrong body and they change their gender in an attempt to correct the incorrect. This might have been difficult in a pre-existentialist era, but now it's widely accepted in most of the developed world you can decide what your identity is. Instead of your biology, society's history, tradition or norms defining you, you have the full control to make yourself and find your own life's purpose. As I said, with this freedom comes responsibility. If you make mistakes, you have to own those mistakes, don't blame others. In other words, if you build a bridge and it collapses, you are responsible. In the same way, you build your own identity, if something goes wrong, you cannot blame others for it. So Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialist philosophy gave the individual the full autonomy to make something of themselves. For him, it wasn't social history, but your own individual history that makes you your own free choices. 
Slavo Žežek was born in Slovenia in 1949. Today he is the most important figure who subscribes to a history-based philosophy. He identifies himself as Hegelian who argues that Marxism has failed miserably because most Marxists today live in the past, too attached to history. Today's Marxists blame history for their failure. In other words, he says that Marxists today have lost touch with reality and live in the past like an old man who has failed in his life projects. This failure is most visible in his own style as he uses comedy to cope with that failure. His philosophy is based on philosophical irony. Marxists believe in history and historical struggle. The very history that these philosophers based their ideas failed their attempt to create a truly socialist society. So history failed a philosophical tradition that based its core philosophy on history. Now that's ironic and so on and so on and so on. You get the point. So to sum up, Hegel said we are the product of history that keeps progressing and Marx said let's not study history but let's speed it up to get our final destination, a communist utopia. Sartre argues forget about class history, we are the product of our own individual history in which we also find our purpose. And finally Zizek says history has failed us all. We have not progressed but regressed, so our history is nothing but a history of failed intelligence or rationality. Next I'll discuss the other strand of philosophy that came out of Kant through Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, which emphasizes not rationality or history or society, but passion or will or human psyche, the mysterious subconscious world of psychological philosophy. Previously I discussed a branch of philosophy that put emphasis on historical and social change as the main motivating factors for human actions. For example, philosophers like Hegel, Marx and Sartre argued that we are the product of history, either society's history or our own personal history. In this segment I'll focus on the other branch of philosophy that is based on the individual human psyche or the blind will that drives human actions. In other words, it's not the history or society but other mysterious forces inside us like passion or the blind subconscious will. The German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer who lived between 1788 and 1860 was firmly against Hegel's philosophy. Schopenhauer took Kant's distinction between the knowable world of phenomena and the unknowable world of noumena to develop his own theory of will and representation. Schopenhauer argued that there is no distinction between the two. They are one and the same thing or two sides of the same coin. He said there is one world which he called will. But this will is mysterious and hard to understand. It's built in inside us. In other words, all living beings and even non-living beings come pre-assembled or pre-installed with this blind will. Since it's built in inside each being, we cannot fully know. We can only know how it's represented or manifested to us but not the will itself. The will itself is hidden from us, all we see is its mere representation. For Schopenhauer our will is the blind driving force in the universe and representation is our perception of that blind will. In other words, will is the essence of the universe and we only see or understand its manifestation in us. He called it will to life or passion for life that we share with all living beings including animals and plants. We all have an innate will to continue living. Since the will itself is blind and universal, we each become its eye through which it looks out to the world. Will is like a gigantic iceberg while our human intellect or human perception of it is only the tip of that iceberg. So Schopenhauer really went deeply psychological about human motivation. Schopenhauer says it's impossible to know the will because as soon as you observe it, it becomes a representation of that will. If you do not observe it, then it is the will. It's like in quantum mechanics, your observation of a particle changes the position of the particle. In other words, if you don't look, it is there, but as soon as you look, it changes position. It's also a kind of catch-22. To understand Schopenhauer's idea of will is to imagine everything in the universe as one thing, let's say atoms that oscillates between everything that exists. It appears to us as something that is not a genuine thing but a mere representation. To fully understand Schopenhauer's will, it's important to mention the Buddhist idea of the self as an illusion or a mirage. For the Buddhist, soul is universal but the self is a mere mirage we acquire in our lifetime. In other words, our essence is not the self we call me or I. 
Schopenhauer too places the blind will at a much deeper place than we understand or we can get to and will only get a representation of it. He also said that will is the cause of our human suffering. Therefore, Schopenhauer is often considered the father of pessimism. Just like in Buddhism, our ego desires things and those desires makes us suffer because we can never satisfy our desires fully. Schopenhauer says, since we have a body, we have a will that somehow controls us and that causes us suffering. So we are all at the mercy of this blind will that urges us to do things. The only way to cope with this suffering is through intellect and art which allows us to move to a state of non-existence like in Buddhist Nirvana. Artists while creating art as well as us while enjoying that art we all experience a moment of non-being while in awe of its beauty. When an art takes our breath away we truly experience non-existence a kind of blissful moment. Schopenhauer influenced the German composer Richard Wagner whose music represents Schopenhauer's philosophy. For Schopenhauer music didn't represent the phenomenal world, therefore it was free from the will and urges, instead it fostered compassion. Schopenhauer had a massive influence on novelists and musicians of the 19th century. He also influenced psychoanalysts, especially Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Schopenhauer also dismissed the idea of God and replaced God with the blind will and this had an influence on our next philosopher. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard lived between 1813 and 1855. He argued that our anxiety comes from our choices or in other words our belief and complete freedom to make choices. In a world where everyone believes in God, where everything is caused by God, people accept it because there is no other choice. In other words, God tells you what to do and what not to do. You have no choice of your own. But we live in a world where we no longer believe in God, so we have the freedom to choose. But this freedom comes at a massive psychological cost. It makes us anxious about our choices and the consequences of our choices. When we are children, we live a carefree life because our parents take care of everything. In the same way, a God-fearing society also lives in a kind of blissful ignorance. Since God is dead or when parents die, we are responsible to make our own choices. The psychological toll of making choices is immense on us. For example, Hamlet agonizes over the question of to be or not to be in Shakespeare's play. Incidentally, Hamlet was also a Dane like Kierkegaard. In the 19th century, hysteria was very prevalent, especially among women. Today, anxiety is more common among both men and women. So absolute freedom makes us anxious. Kierkegaard himself never lost faith in God, but he saw freedom as good and bad. While it makes us anxious and dizzy, it also allows us to make good moral choices. His problem with Hegel's theory of history was that it gave little room for individual freedom because we are bound by the historical force. In fact, we suffer not because of the bigger forces in society, but we suffer through our own action or choices we make as individuals. So Schopenhauer said the blind will motivate us while leaving us with minimum freedom of our own and Kierkegaard said that little freedom induces anxiety in us. Now these two philosophers come together in our next philosopher. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche lived between 1844 and 1900. He was a great admirer of Schopenhauer. He accepted Schopenhauer's idea of the will, but he had a big problem how passive this will to life was. Nietzsche argued that this will, blind it may be, can be harnessed and utilized for great purposes, artistic genius and philosophical flourishing. He changed the passive will to life into a proactive will to power. In other words, we are not here just to live, but we are here to grow, conquer and dominate. Nature is based on competition, not a state of blissfulness or mere survival. Nietzsche saw religion, especially its morality, as the biggest obstacle for individuals to push boundaries in order to achieve greatness. Morality decides what's good and what's bad, so society promotes certain values and restricts others. Nietzsche saw this as a weak-minded way of living that promoted weak or slave mentality. He instead proposed a more nature-based approach in which no morality can restrict innovation, probing artistic creativity and philosophical ideas. Nature wants to grow, dominate, while religions suppress and tame people. Nietzsche proposed the idea of Ubermensch, 
a being who has surpassed humanity into something else, a free spirit artist or a philosophical genius. He is no longer bound by social values and norms because he has shed his human qualities of weakness, enslaved mentality and religious compassion. He is released from all that into an enormous creative energy and exuberance for life. Nietzsche also saw Western philosophy championing rationality at the expense of passion and emotions. For him, passion was as important as reason. Reason is just a tool, it provides us with technology that makes life easier and more comfortable. But reason cannot motivate us to do things that are daring and courageous. Instead, rationality makes us risk averse. This timidness leads us to a hedonism in which we only seek pleasure and avoid pain. This is a kind of nihilistic self-indulgence that makes you lazy and self-centered. Human passion on the other hand motivates us to do things, conquer the world and topple mountains. So Nietzsche's philosophy was based on human passion or the will to power to surpass the current humans into a great genius. Nietzsche didn't believe in equality either because only a handful of people could become great artists and genius philosophers. Not everyone has original ideas. So to sum up, Schopenhauer placed human motivation on the blind, innate will, while Kierkegaard said our anxiety comes from the little freedom we experience, and Nietzsche argued we're driven by will to power or passion to push society forward and innovate. Today, sociology and psychology have replaced philosophy when it comes to human motivation. One of the leading voices of psychology is Jordan Peterson, who was born in 1962 and has adopted YouTube as his platform. Another contemporary voice is the Indian yogi Sadhguru. Peterson believes in human passion and faith, telling young people to take individual responsibility. Unlike Zizek, Peterson doesn't see the world through group identity like class or gender, but through the lens of the individual. His idea of perception is somewhat similar to Schopenhauer's will and representation. Sadhguru, an Indian yogi guru on the other hand, argues that today's world is shaped by materialism and people have conflated the desire for more with happiness. Our goal is no longer happiness but to have more. He argues it's time we reach a higher level of intelligence so we are in charge of our body, not our bodily desires in charge of our mind. He argues that modern society, even science, has become a slave to human bodily desires to make us more comfortable. As a result, it has blinded us from other possibilities of human intelligence or human consciousness to reach higher places. So to sum up, Schopenhauer said we are driven by a universal will or passion for which we have no control and this causes us to suffer, and art is our best cure for suffering. Kierkegaard argued that our anxiety or suffering is also caused by our freedom of choices in life, which kind of negates Schopenhauer's blind will. Nietzsche said this human passion that causes us suffering is also a great tool to do something, create something and become greater than ourselves. Peterson says to ease suffering is to take responsibility and make something of your individual life instead of blaming others. Sadhguru argues for a new form of human consciousness that goes beyond the material world. So to sum up, human philosophy in the last 2500 years has tried to answer many different questions. Early Greeks tried empirical knowledge to explain the world, while early Eastern philosophers tried to psychologically cope with the problem of existence. Then later philosophers tried to explain life's purpose, with the humanists focusing on the equality among humans, while the elitists or political realists emphasized competition to push society forward. Then Kant brought rationalism and empiricism together and the next generation of Germans took him in two separate directions. Hegel went historical saying we are made by history while Schopenhauer went deeper into human psyche saying we are made by a blind will. Perhaps today we are moving towards a new philosophy that is not based on reason but human intuition. To sum up this video, in part 1 I discussed how humans knowledge of death and the rise of rational thinking gave rise to human philosophy in an attempt to answer some of life's fundamental questions like the meaning of life, the nature of reality and the function of the human mind. Then over time each of those topics became a discipline of its own and philosophy gave birth to physics, biology, psychology. 
physics focused on reality, biology on life, and psychology on the human mind. Later, I looked at the various branches of philosophy such as ontology, epistemology, rationalism, empiricism, humanism, utilitarianism, existentialism, and postmodernism. In part 2, I discussed how Eastern philosophy was based around rivers and agriculture, therefore spirituality and fatalism became the dominant philosophical ideas. Western philosophy, on the other hand, was based on oceans and trade, which focused more on rational thinking. The fundamental difference is that Eastern philosophy emphasizes changing oneself, while Western philosophy wants to change the world. I discuss how the Greek giants of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle questioned dogma and promoted rational thinking, while the Eastern trio of Buddha, Lao Tzu, and Confucius showed how not to change nature but become one with nature by changing yourself. In part 3, I discuss the purpose of human civilization and human life. Elitism sees society as a competition ground, while egalitarianism promotes equality. Philosophers such as Sun Tzu, Machiavelli, and Thomas Hobbes saw humans as animals, so they offered a hierarchical social system to mimic nature, where the most adept survive. Philosophers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire promoted equality instead. On the question of knowledge or happiness, Erasmus, Montaigne, Bertrand Russell argued one should prioritize happiness, while philosophers such as Francis Bacon, Heidegger, and Michel Foucault prioritize knowledge to better one's life and understand the nature of society. In part 4, I tackle the question of knowledge by discussing rationalism and empiricism. Rationalists see knowledge as innate inside us, while empiricists see knowledge only coming from outside experience. Kant provided a middle ground saying we have innate mental structure that we put out to the world to give us a more structured understanding of the world. In other words, we are not passive receivers, but active organizers of the world. I also discussed what shapes us and motivates our action. Hegel and Marx's history-based philosophy argue we are the product of history and Jean-Paul Sartre who said we are the product of our own individual history. On the psychological side, we saw Schopenhauer who placed human motivation in the subconscious blind will. Kierkegaard focused on how freedom creates an anxiety. Nietzsche said we can channel the blind will and use anxiety to create art. If you have made it to this point, a huge kudos to you, I really appreciate it. So my question to you, which philosophy or philosopher resonated with you the most? Or a more interesting question is, where do you see philosophy heading? As always, I really appreciate you accompanying me on this long journey. Thank you.